Oh, we can see the attendee names. <laughs> you can see who's there? Uh, Khatik Tolulian is here. <clears throat> <clears throat> we can see the attendee names. <laughs> you can see who's there. Anahit, <clears throat> <clears throat> you have two screens open. Should I? Um. Yeah, I know because oh. I'm. We can leave both. That's okay. I just wanted to <laughs> let you know. Yeah, because uh, my like I would I would rather keep my phone, but there is not enough bat battery there. So I I'm just in case also turned on the computer. But is it like confusing? No, it's okay. It's okay. It, it's <clears throat> your image is only on the one, so it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Okay, everyone. So hello and welcome uh, to day two of the virtual conference, Gender and Intersectionality in Post-Soviet Armenia. This conference is organized by the Zorian Institute in partnership with the UCLA Promise Armenian Institute, with the support of the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research, the Arat Eskegia Museum, the UCLA Gender Studies Department, and the UCLA Center for Near Eastern Studies. So for those of you who were unable to attend yesterday's panels, um, I'll introduce myself. My name is Megan Reed, and I'm the Deputy Executive Director of the Zorin Institute. Um, and if you missed any of yesterday's sessions, we will be uploading those recordings to our YouTube page and circulating to the registered attendees. So you will, you will be getting the link to the full recordings of both days. And yesterday we had the pleasure of hearing from eight scholars and specialists who dis discuss topics ranging from the transformation of discourses about the traditional Armenian family to the gendered experiences of policy production in the Republic of Armenia. And we have an equally impressive lineup of speakers today. And our first panel today, Equity and Empowerment, Creating and Distributing Resources Beyond the Gap, it was originally going to be led by Professor Lerna Ekmejulu, who unfortunately is under the weather today. So Professor Melissa Bilal has stepped into her place. Um, so we thank her for that. Um, and we also have our last panel of the conference titled War, Trauma and Displacement, Gender and Building Peace, which will be led by Professor Huri Gatarian. There will be a 30 minute Q&A period at the end of each session. So please submit your questions in the Q&A chat box um, and the uh, Panel chair will be reading and addressing those questions. Um, at the end of each session. So now, uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first panel chair of the day, Professor Melissa Bilal. Bilal is uh, Professor Bilal is a lecturer in the Department of Ethnomusicology at UCLA. And she serves at the core team developing the American University of Armenia's gender studies program. Dr. Bilal's research and publications focus on Turkey's minority and memory politics and the Armenian experience. She is currently collaborating with Lerna Ekmekjulu on the book and digital humanities project, Feminism in Armenian, a history in documents. Professor Bilal was instrumental in the conceptualization and execution of this conference. And we are so pleased to welcome her today as panel chair for our third panel of the conference, Equity and Empowerment, Creating and Distributing Resources Beyond the Gap. So Melissa, welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Megan. Thank you. Um, hi again, everyone. Um, unfortunately, Lena had a health emergency. Um, so we have three, we originally had a fourth panelist uh, for this panel, Koar Kachadurian, who was going to talk about the impact of COVID pandemic. Uh, but unfortunately, she won't be able to join us. We have three um, incredibly 
knowledgeable and active um, specialists, uh, experts in their fields, uh, three amazing women who happen to be my friends. Uh, and I am really happy to welcome them all. Um, the first panelist is um, Judy Norsigian. Judy Norsigian was a founder, founding member of Our Bodies Ourselves in 1971, and we are very privileged uh, to have her with us today. Uh, she served as its executive director from 2001 to 2015 and currently chairs the board of this organization, best known for the landmark publication, Our Bodies Ourselves. She co-authored all eight Simon & Schuster editions of this book, named by the US Library of Congress as one of the 88 books that shaped America. She was also a member of the editorial team that produced Our Bodies Ourselves, Menopause and Our Bodies, Ourselves, Pregnancy and Birth. Uh, Our Bodies Ourselves seeks to advance the health and human rights of women and girls globally. Judy has appeared on hundreds of television and radio programs and served on numerous boards for organizations such as the National Women's Health Network. Uh, personal recognitions include the Public Service Award from the Massachusetts Public Health Association, the Redcliffe College Alumni Association Annual Recognition Award, and the Massachusetts Health Council Award. She holds honorary doctorate from Boston University and Simmons University. Uh, we are very happy that Judy is with us, and um, we know that her work uh, impacted and changed uh, women's and girls' lives around the world. And her um, presentation title is Might an Intersectional Approach to Problem Solving Better Address Gender-Based Health Inequalities in Armenia? Thank you, Judy. Well, thank you so much, Melissa. And it's an honor to join you all and to be with my good friend, Maro, and um, Anahit joining you. and. Um, all of you who have worked hard on getting this conference together. I will actually not give a prepared presentation. I am going to actually build upon some of the remarks yesterday. I thought it was a very interesting first day. And it also reinforced some of my um, impressions. I've been to Armenia seven, eight times. I am deeply um, impressed by the activism, by the efforts to create social change within a very traditionalist environment, by the energy of youth, by the um, efforts to support transgendered individuals, even in a climate that is so hostile there. Um, and it does reflect upon some of the experiences we've had at Our Bodies Ourselves over the last 50 years or so, working with our global partners around the world. Uh, I will be sending along a document later that will include links to all of the things I mentioned now, so don't people don't have to look them up. I'm not dropping them in the chat. They will all be in one document. And they will reflect some of the um, key things that have uh, come to me as a way to look at addressing some of these challenges with a more intersectional approach. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, but I, I do want to say that some people often think about intersectionality as only gender and race intersecting. And we forget about things like sexuality, ability, age, immigration status. Um, these are all different identities that can interplay and are subject to systems of power that privilege certain people over others. And I always want to have us keep that in mind. Um, and I think in Armenia, we have this incredible power of the role of national identity um, and particularly what's happened recently with the pandemic and with the conflict in Artsakh. I think we have there's a lot of fragility around that identity, but that identity that um, fervent nationalism, it, I see is somewhat related to the kind of tendencies and narratives in this country here in the United States that promotes ideas of white supremacy, that promotes a kind of fearful approach to thinking about greater good for the greater benefit, um, those kinds of things. Yesterday, I was so impressed with many of the comments. Tama Shirinian talked about gender hyster hysteria, and she reinforced for me what I learned in all of my visits 
visits to Armenia about the role of the church in supporting right-wing efforts um, to really smash women's rights and um, to take on the importance of promoting gender equality and equality between men and women. And it reminded me too of how long it takes us to make progress. Uh, you, you will remember um, Morrow, that 10 minute film, Silence Interrupted, that was produced in 2013. I looked at it the other day and I thought, wow, there were even men then saying all of the right things. This was a very good statement of the problem, but we have not made that much progress and the pandemic, like in many other countries, has set us back because of the need to be indoors and the um, excessive um, examples of uh, domestic violence that we've seen. But I think it also underscores things that were said yesterday about the need for constitutional equality. Structured inequality breeds violence against the underclass and it breeds um, gender-based violence. Inequality permits and legitimizes unequal justice so that even though you may have some laws, they're not applied equitably to all people who deserve that. It also underscored for me why we need to engage more in a civil rights framework. We've been doing that here in the United States in our efforts to fight white supremacy. Civil rights uh, framing engages society as an injured party, not just individuals, so that we're all invested in prevention. Civil rights enforcement permits advocacy by state officials, particularly the few who are on our side, shifting the lens from the personal to a public forum. And civil rights narratives eliminate hierarchical thinking, and they support women's equality as normative. I think that consistent application of civil rights laws in education is especially important because young people are developing core ideas about the meaning of sex and gender and the status of women in society. We see this across all countries. Many of our global partners who produce several dozens of examples of our bodies ourselves, uh, not just translated, but culturally and linguistically adapted to um, settings in um, different places across the globe have made it clear that though this core information about our bodies and for women, um, especially women and girls, this core knowledge is essential to being an active participant, to feeling strong enough to even get out there as a player, to say, yes, I have a right in the public market, you know, in the place of ideas where we share what we think and feel. Uh, we do have to feel strong in ourselves before we can get to that point. And it reminded me of some of the comments that were made yesterday by Irina um, Galpanyan. I just... It reminded me of so many women, prominent, talented, brilliant like she is, getting into these settings, which were male dominated and where men refuse to even shake your hands. And they will shake the hands of somebody who is of far lesser stature, far lesser knowledge, uh, um, and try to put you in your place in these nonverbal ways. I myself have had a few of those experiences but I had a father, and I want to say this is very important, the role of fathers in engendering this kind of inner strength you need as a woman who often faces sexism and um, gender discrimination. I had a father who believed in me and asked me to be a strong person and who said at one point when I was just a teenager, you need to have uh, a profession that will support you. You will need to be able to support yourself and your family, because even though I expect you to get married, you never know what the future is going to bring. And it may require you to be strong and independent. It was interesting. You know, I didn't even think about that as making any sort of a you know, difference, but it did. It really planted an idea in me. And when I encountered the kinds of hostility that you do encounter as feminists, even very friendly, welcoming feminists, and I've, I've never um, you know, expressed hostility, even in the face of hostility, I've simply let people have their say, sometimes have to make a loud voice to say, you know, you can't hog the space, other people have to talk. And I was blessed with a loud voice, so I can sometimes match those loud voices and, and just simply keep talking. In television, you have to do this with obnoxious male um, spokespersons and just keep talking till they stop and you have a chance to speak without being interrupted. 
techniques like this, you have to use, you have to learn them. And I want to say that I am so grateful for all the active Armenian feminists uh, in Armenia and elsewhere who are really fighting the good fight on this. Now I'm going to get to one of the points that was in my prepared talk originally. And this is about the vital importance of engaging men who are ready to be engaged and supportive of all of these efforts. Um, there are groups of men across the globe who've decided we have got to support these efforts. We've got to fight gender-based violence by um, thinking about prevention. Where do we start to change the ideas that so many men have that entitle them to be brutal towards the women they marry, the women um, who are their close partners, the women who work with them. And some of this is sexual harassment in the workplace. It's not necessarily the kind of her, um, violence you see in the home. What do we do to engage those men in thinking more carefully and, and committedly about stopping this with an eye to prevention? And I wanna mention three different strategies that we are now um, promoting uh, and so are our global colleagues in countries across the globe, as we engage men as partners in thinking about a difference here. And it isn't just about gender-based violence. It's really also about what we can do to get greater harmony and peace in the world around us. One of these strategies has to do with active bystander mobilization. And again, here we see men working with other women, working with organizations, working on the college campus, working with um, you know, rotary clubs, thinking about um, multiple um, stakeholders and thinking about an intersectional approach. What are we gonna do to train more men to think about what they can do as more active bystanders when they see these examples of harassment or violence around them all the time? How can they intervene without necessarily risking their own um, physical well-being, but try to advance the conversation? Um, you will see a link to an organization that has been longstanding in this um, field and in the document I send along later. The second strategic approach has been promoting nurturing fatherhood and nurturingfathers.org is the premier organization doing this, not just in the United States, everywhere across the globe. Men who become fathers, particularly as they're fathers of young children, are often at a stage where they care deeply about having healthy children, whether they're males or females, and become more active at that point. And they are more readily involved in some of these nurturing fatherhood programs. Then the third strategic um, approach has been what I call public affairs and marketing promotion of men in caring roles. And the Men Care campaign and mencare.org is working again at the global level. There are great examples in, in India and in, the, um, and in the Far East and many, many countries around the globe where they have develop public awareness campaigns really suited for that community. Sometimes they're very local, sometimes they're national, that really look at the role of caring men, not just as fathers, but as the um, sons of elderly parents who might care for them, or who have siblings who have disabilities, so they care for their siblings. There are many ways in which men can play caring roles. And they, this doesn't have to attack their idea of themselves as strong, virile, you know, men. The ideas of masculinity are often in conflict with being caring, loving men in our communities and in our families, but they don't have to be. And I think as we learn from some of these examples, we will um, gain solid ground. And I'm a great believer in finding those men who are ready to become involved and really bringing them into the fold. I'm going to now um, highlight a book that I absolutely adore. It's called The Kaepernick Effect. It's by one of my favorite authors, Dave Zirin. He writes about sports. He writes a regular column for the nation. And in this book, he doesn't talk just about Colin Kaepernick. He talks about other 
sports heroes and um, I should say brave athletes who step up and do something about institutional racism or something that's happening in the community that's outright wrong and saying, I'm gonna be outspoken about doing something here. His examples are so not just empowering, but they're inspiring. And I think they'll be inspiring to many young men in particular. So I want to, I will underscore that. There's another book I want to talk about just briefly. It's not new, but I think it's one of the more powerful ones in reaching men in policymaking positions who are in leadership positions. It's a book called Sex and World Peace by Valerie Hudson. It's a very well-researched book that involves um, the work of economists around the globe. And then it documents how the extent of violence committed against females is the major determinant of whether or not a country is violent within itself or more willing to use military violence against those in other countries. We can think about this in terms of what's happening in Azerbaijan um, as a very good example. This is an indicator, by the way, more important than poverty, natural resources, or the degree of democracy within a country. And I really encourage all of us to get this book, Sex and World Peace. I will include that as well. Um, there is one other place where um, we find ourselves with, uh, shall we say, common ground. As we work towards creating more equity and reproductive justice, why don't women have access to midwives and more responsive maternity care? Even Armenia has problems here. The role of midwifery has been sidelined. And yet, as we have documented, especially more recently, and I will be including these links in my document later, we now see that integrating midwives into the maternity care system is the single most important thing we can do now to improve maternity care outcomes, both for mothers and babies. This is now well-documented. We need more birth centers. We need the kind of responsive care that especially in this country, African-American women have not had. So the results of uh, institutional racism in many of our hospitals have produced very awful birthing outcomes for African-American women, something we can do something about. And Armenia can do something there as well. There's another uh, landscape where we have provided a, a lot of activism, and this is around the global commercial surrogacy business. It is now a multi-billion dollar business that has asked the young women, particularly in industrialized countries, to risk their health to provide multiple eggs through multiple egg extraction for the baby making um, industry. And women in poorer settings are providing the bodies and, as so-called gestational mothers, so called surrogates. This is a huge problem. I will be including links about it in, in my document, but I want to point out that this is a place many of us have come together to say, you know, we have to have informed consent for all of these women involved. They do not get the kind of information they need to make informed choices about their bodies, about whether they want to make money, either selling their eggs or selling their bodies um, to provide babies for better healed, um, you know, middle class families for the most part in other countries. Uh, there are so many ways in which we have disenfranchised individuals providing um, resources to uh, wealthier individuals and countries, and we need to think more carefully about that. These are all part of the larger landscape um, before us. Um, before I close, I just want to say a couple of other things about things that were said um, yesterday. Um, I want to underscore that survey that Gohar Shanazarian um, talk, um, mentioned about the attitudes towards women's leadership. Um, about the cyberbullying and the even outright attacks on human um, women, human rights defenders, uh, the uh, the uh, efforts of the Fem Collective that Nelly Sargisian underscored, including the stories for children. This is one very important way of reaching children and having them think about alternative ways of of addressing these problems. And then I thought Karina had. Um, some very important comments to make about what happens even to those of us who've been hurt by a system that's oppressive, that's racist, uh, that doesn't think about our needs. When she mentioned how some of the women who did not, the uh, women who had immigrated to the US in the Glendale area, 
um, did not go back to Armenia and who are now Trump supporters. It reminded me of the many Armenians I know who have forgotten about our roots, forgotten about what it meant to experience the genocide and what it means to resist forgetting about that genocide and other genocides across the globe by grounding ourselves in the kind of movements for social change that will um, fight genocide denial in all of its contexts and which will also help people understand the false narratives out there are not the ones to believe. We have to understand where true social justice comes from. And it doesn't come from people espousing the values and the policies of Trump supporters. Uh, we see this in the Armenian community here, and I think it's going to be a challenge for all of us um, to address. Uh, there are also comments about the environment and about climate justice that I want to include, and I will, particularly around the connection between reproductive health and the environment in the links that I will send out later. And if you want something inspirational, I'm going to close with this incredible uh, celebration we had about two weeks ago with women in Brazil who have just completed volume one of the three volume adaptation of Our Bodies, Ourselves. And these are women who span four generations, uh, actually three generations, they're activists uh, and included, includes young men as well, who have produced um, an adaptation that is full of energy and vitality that is also linked to activism on the ground in Brazil. And with Bolsonaro there, as you know, he's as bad, if not worse than Trump. This to me is a sign of hope that activists uh, can in an intergenerational way push forward a progressive agenda, fighting for reproductive justice, for um, a, a world in which racism won't be so deeply embedded in all of our institutions, and to bring us all together to say, yes, we have formidable obstacles, but we can and will produce positive change. And I look forward to my next trip to Armenia, which will be early next year, and our next Ewa Zoom, which was going to be included in this um, document I send later, which will be uh, not just later in October, but once a month early next year, trying to engage um, men in fighting um, um, gender-based violence in all of our communities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judy, for your wonderful presentation and touching upon everything that was um, actually in my mind for this panel because I was thinking last night that uh, we should um, address intersectionality more today and this is the right panel to do so. Uh, thanks for bringing in racism, ableism, and uh, I actually maybe, in, uh, this is also for the next two panelists, but also during the discussion, I'm hoping that um, in this panel, we will be able to talk about the relationship between um, class, like dispossessed, economic dispossessed women um, and men, uh, and, and and the impact of it uh, in on their health. Uh, your like research on um, surrogacy is a very important example of that. The relationship between capitalism and um, gender regimes, gender politics, uh, how uh, they actually go hand in hand. And also I was hoping um, that we uh, could touch upon um, if there's any research or uh, any insight on the ethnic and religious minorities in Armenia and the Armenian and non-Armenian immigrants uh, who, who, who live in Armenia, who are now uh, in Armenia, uh, Armenian citizens or non-citizens. So uh, thanks for bringing in the intersectional uh, perspective to our discussion. So, um, and again, like in, in, in we, because we're going to be talking about health and education and, and employment, uh, I'm hoping that we will also be able to discuss a little bit about uh, gender uh, non-binary uh, and trans individuals and how um, their lives are impacted, their well-being is impacted by, um, 
health policies and, and um, the intersection between um, gender regimes in Armenia and, and public policies. So our next speaker, uh, and I also want, I can't, um, I cannot not tell this, but I remember I have this um, really, really um, memorable moments of Judy and her partner, Craig Norbert Baum, uh, who is an activist, incredible changing lives, saving lives, uh, by bringing men into this um, activist um, struggle uh, that she has been talking about. They, they visited, uh, generously visited and lectured for my students at AUA and I could see the, the tangible real impact. Uh, Craig's uh, conversation with young men in my class and young women and gender non-binary uh, individuals in my class, how much um, young men needed to hear this uh, to uh, actually, that, that, that's also good for their well-being. So thank you again. And I am now um, turning um, to Maro Matosyan, who is, um, who dedicated herself to extensive work in the Armenian communities of New York and Paris before moving to Armenia in 1991, where she worked as country director for Aznavo Pour l'Armenie Foundation and since 2006 for the Tufank Young Foundation. In 2010, Maro founded and since has been the executive director of the Women's Support Center NGO, running two shelters and being the premier center offering comprehensive services to survivors of domestic violence. Besides services to victims of abuse, the center does community awareness raising, trainings and advocacy for systemic change in addressing the problem of gender-based violence. Uh, and Mara will today talk about domestic violence in Armenia. And I also remember uh, Mara's uh, impactful lecture to my students and um, thanks Mara for uh, your impactful work in Armenia for saving lives, changing um, the society uh, for the better. Thanks Mara. Thank you. And uh, I want to thank actually Zorian Institute for organizing this conference because it's very rare to have such a um, advanced, I would say, a progressive conference dedicated to women's rights and women empowerment. Um, it's very much needed for our diaspora communities who tend to be also very conservative and also very important for Armenia as well. Um, as you know, there are many types of empowerment and I will talk about um, my expertise in working with victims of domestic violence and um, uh, talking about the empowerment of these victims, which is a much complex process that of recovery and also uh, empowerment. Um, so as we know, violence against women and children is a human rights violation. It is one of the most frequent human rights violations worldwide. The principal cause of the physical and psychological injuries inflicted on women and children are due to violence committed in the family or in, in intimate relationships. Domestic violence largely uh, prevalent in the Armenian context is a heinous manifestation of harmful gender stereotypes and the environment of a patriarchal society. Uh, which makes our work so much more difficult. <laughs> According to research conducted in Armenia in 2011, mm -hmm. uh, commissioned by the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, 60% of female respondents were subjected to one or more forms of domestic violence during their lifetimes, and nearly 40% reported domestic violence in the last two years at the time of the survey. Um, Societies that took measures to combat domestic violence, such as adopting legislation that protects and makes the perpetrator accountable for his action, also proper implementation of laws and gender equity reforms to combat patriarchy, these societies have shown a decrease, a decrease in domestic violence by 60%. In some regions of US, and uh, recently I was in Boston, in Cambridge actually, for example, uh, that for years there was not recorded one single murder due, due to domestic violence. So positive results can occur with correct legislation and a multi-sectoral response to domestic violence. 
besides policy prevention and protection, we also need the fourth P and that is protection. I, I, I mentioned policy prevention and prosecution. And also we need protection. At the Women's Support Center, we run the only two domestic violence centers in Armenia and one walk-in center offering comprehensive assistance, assistance to victims. That is psychosocial support, legal counseling and representation. Our methodology in working with survivors adheres to the principle of empowerment. The empowerment model is one that is a must for dealing with victims of domestic violence. It is a model that is used throughout the world by professional organizations in, in this field. What the survivor experiences in an abusive relationship is a pattern of controlling behaviors. Her abuser feels the right to make all her decisions for her, telling her what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. Uh, in the past, this dynamic has often been recreated by well-meaning service providers who approach victims with a so-called rescuer mentality, telling her how, when, and what she needs to do to recover and get on with her life. Over time, as professionals gain more experience working with survivors, they learn that, th that what victims need most is someone to support their decisions encourage and reinforce their strength and provide resources to achieve their goals. Survivors are most successful when they are in control of their own he healing journey. This approach is called empowerment. Trauma response and empowerment model has been shown to increase personal safety and efficacy and decrease anxiety, trauma, and psychological symptoms. This approach is fundamental in helping a survivor break free from an abusive relationship and learn skills that are critical to her independence, success, and healing. The empowerment model encourages an environment in which the survivor is the leader in her own recovery process, where she's responsible for her action, decisions, and happiness. Our success is gouged when she no longer needs us. Until two years ago, there were only two NGOs working with this model. Uh, we, in collaboration with the Ministry of Social Affairs, were able to train following the empowerment model, 10 additional domestic violence support center, which were women NGOs, uh, one in each region of Armenia. Of course, work experience and continuous training is still required. The problem is that within various ministries, we do not have experts in the area of gender-based violence to understand the dynamics and thus adapt policies that are conducive uh, to combat gender-based violence. And this is exactly what Judy was talking about, being a civil rights activist um, to, to, um, uh, uh, to advance this um, narrative and to, uh, to advance the prevention and combating uh, gender-based violence. And at all levels, we have to be uh, really activists. So uh, survivors are not um, only able to live a, free, a life free of abuse, but also they become breadwinners for their families, which further strengthen their self-esteem and self-confidence, things that the perpetrator diligently worked to destroy. Unfortunately, many young girls in Armenia come from controlling families where the father or brother also do not allow them to make decisions or grow independent. Girls marry young and often move from one controlling environment, that of parental household, into that of marriage, which can be even more controlling by her partner or mother-in-law. Economic empowerment programs are very useful for survivors as they develop skills and organizations like ours provide tools for them to run their small business. Most unskilled women choose to work in the agricultural section, sector, beauty salons, food production, or uh, sewing, which unfortunately are gender skills. Some empowered survivors also become advocates, and this is really the, 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 the last stage or as um, uh, is mentioned in the Trauma and Recovery uh, book by, um, ah, I forgot the name now. Uh, it's the last stage of empowerment that um, survivors becomes advocates themselves. They speak out against domestic violence. 
and um, this is very empowering to them. And uh, it's important for us as women organizations because they help us to lobby for legislative change, pointing out to the needs of survivors and to sensible, fair and impartial treatment of them to avoid bias, stereotypes and re-victimization from state bodies working with victims of gender-based violence. Now, I would like to um, conclude by giving you an example to see the, the dynamic of, of recovery and, and empowerment of a, of a victim. And I'll give you a typical example, uh, which is um, of a woman that comes to the shelter who is completely shell-shocked. Uh, she cannot really uh, function because the trauma effects affect her cognitive, her physical, psychological well-being. Uh, after two weeks of being at the shelter, away from the terror and the violence, she finds somehow her equilibrium and um, with the help uh, afterwards with the psychologist and the social worker, she moves uh, uh, progressively to, towards healing. And uh, to give you an example of how much affected they are by the trauma is, for example, they start preparing dinner and they cannot complete the task. In other words, they cannot focus, they cannot concentrate, they can they um, uh, they wander uh, around, they are not uh, uh, functional uh, enough to, to uh, accomplish a task. So obviously in this state, they cannot even hold a job. So economic empowerment by itself is not sufficient as a formula. Many, many people think that giving women jobs and making them economically independent will solve all the issues. That is not the case with victims of domestic violence. So um, finally, when, they, when we see that they are more, more balanced, uh, their well-being, uh, and they recover, uh, then we ask them, you know, uh, what can you do? What, the, what, what skills do you have? And they say, I know nothing. I cannot do anything. And this is very typical because the abuser um, constantly put in her head that she's worthless. She cannot do anything right. And with the effects of trauma, inevitably she could not do anything right. So um, uh, she really believes that she's incapable of doing anything. So uh, for, uh, we, uh, we always ask them, so what did you do before you got married? And then they start thinking and they say that, well, you know, I used to cook well, I used to sew, I used to do something. And we had a case, a woman was an accountant. She was not allowed to work during her marriage. Um, upon separation, when we asked her coming out of shelter, what do you want to do? She said, I cannot do anything right now. I only, I'm only, go only going to clean houses. That's all she wanted to do at that time. So we let them do her do that. And then uh, after a few uh, weeks, we asked her, how is it going? And we had the, we found out that there was a program or refresher program in accounting. And I said, why don't you try? See what happens, uh, no commitments. And sure enough, she became an accountant and not only in the company that she works, she became head of the accounting department. So you see the, the trajectory from, being a worthless person to finally achieving something. And um, we have a lot of examples of women who became uh, tailors or um, uh, food production uh, and were able to expand their uh, business from home. But this requires a lot of understanding of the problem these women have. And it's not a, a, a formula of empowerment. Many people in the diaspora think that if we put more money into and give more to these women, um, they will be able to uh, become independent from their abusers. It is much more than that. It's a, it's a state of mind, it's healing, it's uh, building self-confidence, um, uh, healing the trauma, and also putting the seeds of feminist thought in their mind because this is so important when they think that they when they break those gender stereotypes and they start thinking of their worth and they start thinking understanding that they are not second rate citizens in uh, in any society so with this i'm going to pass the baton to anahid who is a equally powerful activist <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you so much, Maro. And thanks especially for bringing um, this control culture uh, into um, the discussion because I was thinking that this, uh, the whole like controlling bodies, controlling um, sexualities, controlling um, behaviors, gender, gender identities, controlling lives and bodies is this hysteria. It, it is the reason that creates all these, um, the gender hysteria that we were discussing yesterday. And uh, it also has a lot of, it, the, again, like the intersectionality aspect of it, uh, controlling poverty, controlling um, xenophobia, uh, anti-poor, like this elitization of, um, especially I see it in Yerevan, that like there is this uh, growing hatred against um, poor people, uh, hate also xenophobia and I'm even I even heard young people talking about eugenics there's a there's a crazy confusion between uh, survi survival and self-determination as a people and the uh, and being a like control freak fascistic society so like that manipulation of trauma the manipulation of collective trauma into some kind of like control, uh, totalitarian control freak uh, in every sector of life is uh, a very important and, and it connects everything we see it in every uh, sphere of life. So well, I, I just want to mention that it all is rooted to what Judy said, gender equality. And if we want to have a democratic society, uh, we have to work towards equality uh, on all levels. Uh, but that's and, and the effects of, of war and uh, militarization and uh, machoism that goes on and um, uh, 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 the, the, the importance given to ma men in society uh, and not only men, now we're talking about heroes. We're talking about people that gave their lives to the to for this war for defending the country, and therefore we as women are are only good to uh, to be mothers of future heroes, and that's where now uh, we stand in society. And th this uh, this is a huge and complex topic to discuss and to analyze. And yeah, thank you, Judy, for mentioning that. Thank you. So our last panelist today uh, the, in, on this panel is Anahit Simonian, my dear friend. Um, Anahit, who is a researcher, human rights practitioner, and feminist activist based in Armenia. Her areas of expertise include women's rights, protection from violence and discrimination, and advancement of social economic rights. Anahit holds MA in Theory and Practice of Human Rights from the University of Essex, um, England, United Kingdom. Throughout her work, Anahit cooperated with numerous local and international human rights organizations and networks. In 2018, Anahit co-founded the Human Rights Research Center, a non-governmental organization based in Armenia, and she is currently the director of uh, this center. Over the past six years, Anahit authored and co-authored more than 20 researches, articles, and publications on such issues as combating violence against women and girls through legislation and policy, protection of labor rights, and harmonization of domestic legislation with international labor standards, housing rights, health rights, education emergencies, uh, anti-discrimination and inclusion, youth participation, the use of UN complaints procedure, human rights-based approaches in policy making, development of rights-based poverty reduction policies, collective memory and human rights related official state discourse, societal pressure on women involved in human rights protection and activism and anti-gender tendencies, Narratives and Perceptions of Justice in Armenia, Revision of Human Rights Guarantees under the Constitution of Armenia. Uh, I'm sure there is more. Uh, and I also uh, have to say that when I was teaching at AUA, I don't want this to be about my class, but I uh, also, because we, uh, uh, we don't have uh, an educator, 
uh, per se in this on this panel, but all of these people are educators. Uh, they they all came to my class and educated uh, our uh, students, and Anahit was one of them. Uh, that's why I want to also highlight um, these two panels as also as educators. Anahit came to my class uh, and lectured on something that myself was not an expert of uh, the Istanbul Convention and my student, everybody's minds were so confused and we really appreciate uh, a legal uh, specialist to tell us uh, the content and read out loud with the students what the convention is about. So I'm turning the floor to Anahit now. Oh, sorry, Anahit, I forgot to read the title of your um, so her presentation title is Labor Rights in Armenia, the Gender Lenses. So hello everyone. And thank you dearest Melissa and Maro for passing the floor. And um, genuinely it is a privilege uh, to share the panel with you, with uh, Judy, with Alison. And I'm really happy to, to see you as the co-panelists. Um, so I won't take uh, long to dive into the topic of our today's discussion. Uh, I'd like just to mention that uh, the in-depth research and advocacy for improved protection of labor rights in Armenia is uh, among the key pillars uh, of, of our work uh, nowadays. And I'm really genuinely happy to see the interest towards uh, the, this topic um, uh, among the participants uh, of our panel today. So thank you very much for joining as well. Uh, so today I will be talking about protection of rights of um, workers and more specifically women workers uh, with family responsibilities uh, in Armenia. And this is the, one of the aspects, uh, one of the gender lenses that I find very important to put uh, on the issue of protection of labor rights uh, in Armenia. Um, so where this... Um, um, issue and, and the uh, um, highlights that I'm going to, to make are coming from. So for the last uh, one year and a half, over the year and a half, uh, Human Rights Research Center with the uh, colleagues from Caucasus Research and Resource Center Armenia and UN Women Georgia, uh, were conducting quite a comprehensive research on assessing the impact of potential ratification of several uh, conventions of international labor organization that could have a um, substantial impact in case they are ratified and properly implemented, that could have a sub substantial impact on protection of women's uh, labor rights and provision of equal opportunities for their involvement in the labor market in Armenia. And one of the conventions that we were um, working on assessing the um, potential impacts of the ratification uh, was the convention is the convention on workers with family responsibilities uh, ILO convention c156 uh, something that um, a convention or an area of, of um, labor relations or labor issues that may be not being talked a lot uh, in Armenia but is very intersected uh, with different um, gender related issues and gendered norms and stereotypes about the role of women in the family and in the society and in different spheres of society and particularly in labor market. Uh, so based on the research conducted today, I'll be more focused um, on talking about how gender norms can affect participation of women with family responsibilities in the labor market and what legislative and policy measures shall be undertaken uh, by the state to ensure the full realization of uh, women's rights to work. Uh, and why I really um, prioritize talking about this um, particular um, uh, area or particular um, group of workers, such as, group, uh, such as workers with family responsibilities or, or women with family responsibilities, uh, is that the challenges that can, we can see that are arise uh, for this particular group of workers show how um, negligence about gender stereotypes, uh, about um, attitudes and approaches typical to patriarchal society that can limit women in different areas uh, of social life if they are neglected uh, while designing uh, legislation or policy, and in particular case, labor legislation and policy, will inevitably lead uh, to um, creating an insufficient environment in the country 
both um, policy and legal and societal environment that would ensure equal participation of women uh, in labor, uh, realization of their labor rights and uh, preventing them from having equal uh, opportunities uh, for economic participation in the country. So how we're going to explore the topic, um, I would suggest we have a quick look at some data and we'll try to interpret it in the context of existing social norms in Armenia. And then we'll have a quick look at the legislation policy and uh, we'll come up with some ideas how we could avoid those um, uh, limitations uh, and challenges if uh, those um, particular provisions or, or policy um, strategies would be designed keeping in mind challenges that women are having uh, in, in terms of uh, labor participation. Um, so let's just uh, focus on data first. Uh, the recent data from Armenian Statistical Committee shows that, uh, whereas uh, some, somehow 37% of labor resources uh, of labor population in Armenia were out of labor force, 67% uh, of those not participating in the labor force were women. Uh, so you can see uh, how high the number is. Uh, moreover, the share of women working part-time in Armenia is two times more than that of men, 25% versus, uh, versus 12, and 99% of all engaged in housekeeping uh, are women, and the bulk of these women cite housework and other duties as the reason for their unemployment status, status which never happens in the case of men. On top of all that statistic, uh, women in the workplace uh, are earning only 39% of what men earn. So we have quite a substantial also uh, gender pay gap. Uh, and uh, all of these statistics are also, must might also be accompanied by the um, uh, knowledge that women in Armenia typically are doing, and this is also proven statistically, statistically are doing uh, better in education. Uh, and have a higher share among the population with higher education in Armenia than men. So we have sort of a situation then uh, usually you would assume that having uh, been doing better in education or having more share in higher education, you, employment uh, rates for women in Armenia should have been equally successful or be on the equal level as for the men, as well as their um, pay rates, which is not the case. Uh, so where, uh, what is the explanation of the uh, existing data? There have been multiple studies during the recent years that demonstrate that one of the root causes of female unemployment in Armenia is the uh, inappropriate burden of family responsibilities that they bear, as opposed to the insufficient contribution to, uh, of men to households related activities. And the social norms prevailing in Armenia that are very much um, are completely typical of patriarchal society uh, indeed have a significant impact on women's economic activities. Uh, the studies show that, uh, for instance, inactive women make up the majority of young female population. Despite having work skills, uh, they are left out of the labor market due to the family responsibilities or uh, child, child care. And uh, for young women in case of marriage, the responsibilities of carrying out unpaid family work are, uh, and care are given uh, priority over work outside of the house. And uh, in general, the role of a man providing for the family is valued much more than the similar role of a woman, uh, as well as the number of married women working part-time, as I mentioned, is higher than the number of men uh, with the same status. Um, so uh, it shows us the, the situation on the ground, uh, which can inevitably, which will inevitably lead to uh, lower rates of women's participation in the labor market. And the researches both in Armenia and outside of Armenia show that uh, persons with family responsibilities are very much vulnerable per se to the, uh, in terms of the access to the labor market. Uh, and they're of um, having in terms of having their chances are lower in terms of having adequate standards uh, of living. Uh, so in general, discrimination based on family responsibilities uh, can lead to reduced incomes and even a person or in the case when person and family can fall into an um, unsurmountable poverty chain. So this is an issue that must be really addressed by the state 
and must be addressed from gender perspectives and having the gender lenses because it's so much uh, rooted uh, in the gender stereotypes that preclude women from uh, successful uh, participation uh, in the labor market. So if we look at some of the legislative regulations in place in Armenia and how they uh, impact what is the their gender uh, lenses and how they can disproportionately impact uh, on women. So first of all, uh, one of the core uh, actions by the state that needs to be taken is designing a special state policy, state labor policy that would actually address um, issues of workers with family responsibilities and mentioning this, I. Uh, also need to mention that in general, Armenia lacks state uh, labor policy at all. So there is no state policy in the place, but if there is uh, such a policy, which was underway during the, uh, the last couple of, the, during the last two years, it was never adopted. But in, case, in any event, uh, even if designed so far, it has never been addressing specificities of issues uh, with persons with domestic, um, persons with family responsibilities. So several aspects of uh, regulations that need to be put in place in order to ensure their full uh, participation would be, for instance, ensuring free choice of employment, ensuring conditions of employment and uh, social security, ensuring proper community services. And in all of these uh, regulations, uh, special attention to, the, uh, attention to the challenges that women can be facing and need to be um, put in place. For instance, when we look at, at the social security issues, Social security uh, benefits targeting workers with family responsibilities in Armenia are mostly aimed for persons caring for children under two years old and persons caring for a sick family member for a short term. Uh, whereas when it comes to taking care of an adult sick family member that needs a long term care, there is no, uh, there are fully, uh, such instances are fully excluded from the social security benefit systems. And because we know that when it comes to the long term care, especially for adult or elderly family members, it is something that is being predominantly done by women, this lack of this regulation inevitably and disproportionately will affect women rather than men. So whereas the regulation applies to any cases and circumstances, it has a disproportionate effect uh, because of the already uh, inadequate uh, inadequacy of um, uh, in, 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 in equal performance and uh, gender uh, norms that are having the impact of performance of men and women within the family. Another example uh, in this uh, context uh, that might be interesting and important uh, to look at uh, from the perspective of legislative and policy change is social services uh, and community services. So having um, proper social and community services on its own is very much important for enabling uh, workers with family responsibilities to be able to successfully combine work and family uh, responsibilities per se. So we can look at um, social and community services from the perspective of uh, both a provision of subservices for elderly care and for the child care. If we look at the elderly care services, the at-home uh, social services provided by the states in Armenia assume care services to the single elderly individual, uh, to the single elderly and individuals uh, with disabilities. Social care services, however, uh, are provided on the basis of an individual or family social assessment, considering existing opportunities and priorities. And if there is a large number of people in need of services, there, is, there are very long uh, lists, waiting lists, uh, to be able to reach, uh, to, to be able to receive uh, some, some care. Uh, in the cases for elderly people. So uh, for those families where men and women with elder, uh, elder care responsibilities are not covered by existing programs, the only solution for them uh, will be either acquiring uh, services from private institutions, which will be not affordable for the majority of the population, or one of the spouses will have to stay at home and take care uh, for them uh, elderly uh, person that needs a particular type of care. And in these cases, once again, it will rather be uh, the woman, but not uh, uh, the, fe the female, uh, it will rather be the female, not uh, the male responsibility. 
When it comes to the organization of childcare, uh, once again, uh, despite the fact that we can say that Armenia has quite a large coverage of childcare uh, and preschool institutions, they are not uh, sufficiently adapted to different groups of children, for instance, such as children with disabilities. Uh, and research shows that uh, when there is a children with disability in family, it's once again mother uh, who takes the primary care for the child and it's uh, disproportionately or um, we can even say completely impacts her chances for uh, labor and uh, for any work outside of the house or any doing anything that does not relate to taking the care of the child. So once again, services that do not target children with uh, disabilities, a uh, lack of those services will once again affect uh, women uh, with family responsibilities or with such responsibilities disproportionately. So these are uh, just a few examples that show uh, how, how important it is to have gender lenses while designing uh, legislation and policies, uh, because even those of the regulations or approaches that can be seen as, as neutral or applying to the whole population uh, always will have disproportionate uh, impacts on uh, more vulnerable groups and the groups uh, of the society that are uh, very much targeted by uh, dominant uh, norms and approaches such as in the case of women within patriarchal societies. And I think that discussions about how patriarchal societies and patriarchal norms and uh, gender stereotypes and deeply rooted attitudes are impacting women's labor rights and labor participation and how the state should really give a priority to addressing all of those issues, both uh, through legislative policy and educational and promotional measures uh, should be very much talked uh, about and should be turned into a core priority because as Maro mentioned very uh, rightly, um, economic empowerment and the ability of women uh, to be providers for, for themselves and for their family and for their families and for their kids and also um, self-realization in the labor market uh, is one of them core aspects uh, of our identities. And this is how we as, as individuals and as women in societies that constantly challenge us can uh, provide our, can provide social grounds, economic grounds for our independence, for our own decision-making and advancement, both in the family and outside of it in the society. So, because I have already, I think, overstepped the limits of, uh, of the time, this will be it, thank you. Thank you very much, Anahit. Uh, I am going to read. So you can type in your questions uh, to the Q&A box or to the chat box if you like, but we prefer Q&A box. So I am going to read uh, a question to all three panelists um, by Huri Katarian. Thank you for this powerhouse of a panel bridging activism to scholarship and back. The question is directed to all three Oh, all three of you. How do you see building institutionalized cross sections between the education, health and law sectors in Armenia? So we start working on these fundamental issues uh, early on. And I see that Judy uh, responded. Uh, Judy, would you like to read your uh, response out loud so that people can hear it? Uh, sorry, you are muted. Judy, we can't hear you. I, no, I know. It just didn't unmute right away. There is noise around here, so I have to keep myself muted. Um, I, I just answered, and it, I think, is one of the best questions for all of us to think about. My own experience has been that I've made most of the progress I, that I see when we develop the people who are in settings and in communities uh, that I have not had much contact with, but they're friendly allies. And I start with a personal meeting, with a conversation about my own life, where I've come from. Sometimes it does involve talking about my Armenian roots and my um, knowledge of the genocide and how that instilled in me very early on a sense of social injustice and what we need to do to 
not just prevent future genocides, but to be actively um, in opposition to the kind of violence we do to one another in communities in so many ways. And those initial conversations sometimes lead to a, an idea for how to engage this person's group of stakeholders, um, you know, a group of, you know, child care educators, uh, a, a group at the, you know, um, the Rotary Club, a church group. Um, I remember when I spoke to the St. James Armenian Men's Club, which, of course, women go to, I was totally, um, you know, curious about what kind of response there would be. And there, of course, was a range, you know, very traditional men who espouse those attitudes we discussed yesterday. Um, everything we do is going to be an assault on the traditional Armenian family. It will destroy things as we know it. And as someone pointed out yesterday, yes, we kind of do want to destroy some things as we know it, which is the horrible oppression of women in many families and the violence done to women, the gender based violence to gay, lesbians and other transgendered individuals that we really need to do something about all of that. And as I put in the, um, the note, I have had or have a friend who was very um, unsympathetic to the concerns and rights of transgendered individuals and watching one of the early iterations of Mel, which I think is a very powerful and important documentary, that person's ideas got turned around because he watched this very powerful personal story and the struggle that Melina had becoming Mel and, you know, and her getting political asylum in the Netherlands, the whole story was quite moving. And it, it spoke to him in a way that I don't think any lecturing could have. So I think we do need documentaries, we need personal narratives, but we also need safe settings in which we can talk about these things. And it's why I so deeply appreciate those men who step up to the plate and say, we've got to do more to be nurturing men in this world in all the ways we could be. Uh, I don't think it's easy and I think you, you have to have this sort of idea that when you're going to a dinner, a social event, a church event, you know, a public rally, always have in your mind, um, is this person I'm talking with a person I might open up a conversation about these larger issues and create a community setting where we can talk about them? Because they, they, they we start small and then we can grow to a movement. But we do have to reach out to people who are not already there with us. Uh, we have to spread the, um, the ideas in a way that will get more of us um, in this movement. It's still relatively small. I think about the men's movement taking decades to even get where it is now. So we're up against a lot of obstacles and I will name number one, the church. And I was so glad you captured um, Daja Davidian in that short video, Maro, because he, for me, was one of the few members of the clergy who could speak understandingly about these attitudes and yet um, wanted to challenge the younger members of the clergy, clergy to think differently. We need those younger members uh, on board with us. Thank you, Judy. Maro and Anahit, would you like to? Well, um... I understood the question a bit differently. Um, there, there has to be a collaboration and coordination between uh, justice, health, and education. When we have to deal with uh, societal issues in, at large, whether it's the labor market or gender equality or domestic violence, whatever. Uh, unfortunately, in Armenia, there is no um, uh, there is no culture of collaboration and coordination. Even within a ministry, uh, and I give you an example, which may sound very bizarre. There is a department for women and family, and then there is a department for children, as if children do not belong to the family, whatever. There are two departments. Believe me, they do not consult with each other. And they also, when I tell them, well, this has to do with those old children, well, we don't have jurisdiction over them. We cannot tell them what to do. And then, okay, stop. We cannot collaborate anymore. So, and, and in between ministries, is the, it's even worse. Um, and we don't have the mechanisms of, uh, let's say, um, 
uh, work groups that need to collaborate and at the multi-sectoral sectoral level and coordinate their um, their uh, their work because this has it has to be collaborative and it has to it has to be people that have expertise in a certain field in order to see the uh, intersection between the different the different fields so um, to conclude i have to say that unfortunately we don't have that now in armenia uh, we are working at it we are pushing for it <laughs> it will take you know a lot of um, uh, sweat and tear. Uh, there are some movements, but we are not still there. Um, th then I saw another question here about um, uh, facing the challenges that we identified. What is the uh, um, experience in other countries? Well, I have to say that um, I think that Armenia has come a long way. Now, I know that the younger people, uh, like uh, Anahid's friends will contradict me on this, <laughs> but um, because they are more impatient, they want to see more change and I rightly so. But I think we came a long way, uh, uh, thinking of where, how things were in the Soviet system, that they had to have um, uh, um, a society that was completely, uh, was perfect. Unlike capitalist societies, our uh, Soviet uh, communist societies, they didn't have any problems. They didn't have social problems. They didn't have gays, they didn't have prostitutes. They didn't have domestic violence. They didn't have incest. But well, lo and behold, when there was not that iron fist to control society, all these problems surfaced. Discrimination surfaced. Uh, violence surfaced, all, all sorts. Of, and we were not prepared to deal with it. We didn't have social worker, we didn't have psychologists, we didn't have legislation. So fortunately for Armenia in a way, uh, whatever happened in the United States in the 60s and 70s that they came about to learn about these things, to research and advance the, the studies uh, in, in gender on gender issues, Armenia was able to uh, adapt because you know uh, these issues are um, worldwide. It's not uh, the, the domestic violence is the same in India as it's in China as it's in Armenia and as it is France. You know it's no different. It's the same as as cancer is the same and the, and the treatment for it is the same. So so um, we 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 learned from what was done already for us in the past 20, 30 years. And we adapted those. So therefore, we didn't have to reinvent the wheel in many, in many ways. And advances occurred faster in a way. I mean, it took how many years, Judy, in the United States Violence Against Women's Act? Like 40 years to be adopted, you know? And every five years has to be renewed or something like that. So, so we have a domestic violence law. It's not perfect, but we're working to improve it. Um, there are there are issues that uh, there is a strong leap forward um, compared to other countries that started from zero themselves. Um, the biggest problems, and perhaps it's a problem for all patriarchal society, is to combat the gender stereotypes, to combat the mindset, to change behavior. That's the most difficult thing in changing mentalities. It takes a long time. It takes a long period of, and you know, when Anna was talking about labor rights and the attitudes of, of women being caretakers and, and taking care for the elderly, well, <laughs> in the United States, we don't have any protection for that either. You know, we don't um, um, uh, caretakers or we don't have paid by the state to do the, that type of job. So uh, yes, these are issues that are global issues. And um, luckily we have the, the um, experience from uh, more, um, um, let's say advanced countries in these areas and the research that has been done and that we can lean on it. And, you know, <clears throat> um, this week, this coming week, uh, I will uh, welcome at my center a delegation of 17 uh, representatives from the Iraqi government who have no, absolutely no protection for domestic violence and no legislation and nothing. And they want to learn. So uh, to me, that's something uh, 
that I can do to help uh, spread the word and help the, the, those communities is fantastic. But um, so it's relative to where we are and where, where other people are. Um, yes, we don't criminalize anymore uh, homosexuality, uh, but um, uh, you know, in, in Iraq, for example, they kill those pe the the homosexuals. Uh, but uh, in other respects, you know, uh, we are lagging in terms of discrimination, um, uh, in terms of um, uh, violence, uh, which is verbal or physical towards individuals. Uh, yes, uh, hate crimes, that's what I wanted to say, hate crime and hate speech, that we are way behind and on that as well. Thank you, Mario. Thanks for bringing up the, the, the reality that this is the global fight and uh, women's bodies and non-conforming bodies are, um, are globally attacked right now, <laughs> especially in my experience. I'm in the States right now and I have lived in Turkey for uh, decades, so I can say that. Um, uh, the, we, we have many reasons to be hopeful for Armenia because we have such a powerhouse um, activism. Um, so Anahit, would you like to, can you also uh, maybe Anahit reflect on another question, both these two questions and also the, a third question that is addressed to you. Um, hello, this is a question for Anahit. As an Armenian woman working in the labor movement in the US, I wanted to ask, do you see any potential for grassroots labor activism to complement policy action supporting workers and particularly women workers in Armenia or have any thoughts on what effective labor organizing activism among women in Armenia could look like? For example, establishing unions in workplace sectors where women are vulnerable, mass mobilizations to advocate, advocate for the establishment of state policies to support women workers. Thank you so much for this amazing talk. Oh, wow. Thank you so much for the question. <laughs> I'm definitely going to focus on that one uh, since it is um, really straightforward related to the topic, but we'll also um, we'll try to have, have something to say in relation to the others. So um, I just wanted to mention, Maro, that I agree that there is an improvement, uh, even from the perspective of uh, uh, the path that representatives of my generation have went through. Uh, I, I can state that there is, uh, as equal as to the challenges that we face today. And uh, I think for me, one of the, um, the beauties of, of the fight for um, equality and women's rights in Armenia is intergenerational cooperation. And I've learned a lot uh, from the older generation of feminists uh, and activists and women's rights uh, practitioners, uh, and Mara, you are one, one of them, definitely, and other representatives of, for instance, the Coalition uh, to Stop Violence Against Women, and it cannot be underestimated. As equally as I can never underestimate the power of resistance that the generation, which is even younger than me, has now, and sort of activism that they are doing is something that maybe my generation wouldn't. Which was not of. there, Anna. Twenty years ago, we didn't have those. Young people. Yes, and it was not. And what I'm trying to say that it wasn't there seven years ago, also when I was starting. So I believe that we we do. Uh, learn from each other and we do look to each other's uh, each other's experiences and I believe this is the this is the utmost power that helps us to move forward uh, despite many difficulties that are indeed there uh, so going back to the to the question specifically related to uh, labor rights and unions and uh, indeed thank you very much for that question uh, it, it, it also quite echoes with, with the issue of cooperation and uh, links between health sector, um, educational sector, and other uh, social spheres uh, in terms of um, women's rights and gender equality. Um, I would say that unfortunately, there, there is no strong um, uh, movement or grass or, or, or strong discourse around ultimate protection of social economic rights in Armenia. And uh, when were you referring to US, Maro, 
let's just agree that the United States of America, in United States of America's protection of social and economic rights are not their forte. So uh, we can take another state uh, for, for the example. Uh, but I think the realization that social and uh, economic and cultural rights are actually rights and they must be demanded uh, is something that is being um, uh, really progressing and forming in Armenia during the recent years. It doesn't have a lot of past, and of course it has to do with um, difficult uh, social economic conditions for for long time, poverty and power management and uh, educational system. Uh, and as, as the reason uh, we also, and it is interconnected that uh, labor unions and the work of the labor unions is cannot be considered as anything, unfortunately, very much strong in Armenia. So there is a long way to go uh, in, in this country to achieve a proper mobilization around the protection of social rights and labor rights at the first place. And this is one of the, um, I think the most difficult problems in countries that are facing poverty as the major social issue, because people are so much dependent on their employees and um, oligarchic uh, system has so much uh, prevalent and the, it was basically the driving force of the economic structure of this country for so long, uh, that basically labor exploitation, um, unequal conditions, uh, um, unhealthy conditions and dangerous conditions and work, so lack of uh, inadequacy of working conditions, uh, discrimination, harassment at the workplace uh, are all the issues that um, have never been properly addressed by the state. And so far, none of the uh, governments of Armenia has never shown a will to actually stand for the protection of labor rights of Armenia. So labor rights challenges are being endlessly discussed. We all know ab about them. Some of them are being much less talked about than the others, such as exploitation, such, such as sexual harassment, such as very inadequate conditions. And believe me, this concerns both men and women. Men in mining sector are working in such appalling conditions. I, I will never forget uh, the interviews that we we're, were conducting uh, for one of the research uh, which is, uh, of ours around uh, working conditions. Uh, the stories that they can tell about the conditions they work in, you will never forget those. And when it comes, for instance, to the issue of sexual harassment at workplace, which is not uh, at all addressed by the legislation, and it's not even talked about because there are no mechanisms for uh, addressing in, it, uh, in terms of, of uh, legislative safeguards, but also there is a huge culture of save, uh, uh, shaming at victim blaming and women who raise uh, those issues will need to get protection at the workplace. Uh, nor they can be sure that they can feel safe themselves in the environment, in the society in general. And then the third pillar is that what you do after complaining or raising labor rights issue uh, in view of very poor performance of uh, labor union system in the country, you basically do not have a sufficient level of self-organization of self-support on one hand, and on the other hand, the state machinery and judicial system are not there to protect labor rights and to restore violated labor rights in a way that uh, they should be, in a way that the justice should be upheld in these terms. So you will finally, in a way, find yourself in a deadlock and you uh, either need to realize that you will have to quit once raising all of those issues, or you will have to continue working or performing in them the same conditions. Uh, but despite uh, the obstacles, I can say that, uh, by the way, again, among also, no, actually, no, I, I was going to say among the younger generation, but then I could remember some of the um, uh, protests uh, actually uh, brought up by elder generation uh, in terms of labor conditions or social security benefits. For instance, in 2014, I can remember, um, I wasn't part of it, uh, obviously, wasn't uh, at the age at the moment, uh, but there was quite a big mobilization of women because of the um, uh, proposed cuts on maternity benefits in Armenia. Uh, I remember that last year during COVID, uh, some of the workers of the major um, uh, 
uh, employees that uh, are also have quite oligarchic uh, stance uh, in the uh, in the country were complaining against their labor conditions. But they, I also remember how in the midst of the worst, like the strictest lockdown, uh, the uh, owner of the um, um, sewing fabric in, in Gyumri, which is one of the largest uh, in Armenia, and most of the employees there are women, were forcing his uh, employees uh, to go to work when the whole country was in the pandemic, was in the lockdown, and he barely faced any substantial fines for that. And those women uh, actually had no choice but to obey and uh, in, even in these circumstances when there was such a high da danger of, of, of health, uh, but uh, once again, poverty and the fear of losing the job uh, is, is a very uh, big factor and none of us knows how we will perform if we would be in such situation. Uh, so just, um, just to sum up, um, Oh, and I also remember that uh, right now, uh, what caught my attention, there is a younger generation of journalists that have been studying at the, you know, one of the, uh, at the courses of one of the leading um, journalistic media agencies, HEC. Uh, they started a journalistic in investigation into uh, the forms of exploitation that young people are facing uh, in the field of uh, services, uh, service provision as waiters or uh, other type of service provision, because this is a field that mainly a younger generation is being involved in. And there is, there is so much of exploitation there that's not being addressed, that's not being dealt with by the state for decades. Uh, with any prospect of protection of the workers for that sector. And I just remember the, the fundraising video that they have and all of the speakers of this video calling for people to raise funds so they can continue the investigation where uh, young female journalists uh, uh, who also happen to work uh, in the service provision sector. And it was very empowering, empowering for me. Uh, both as as a social rights advocate and as a woman to say to see how they come forward because it's not uh, it's not easy at all. Um, so um, I think there there are processes and there is there is a growing um, realization among the especially the younger generation um, that uh, social issues are inseparable uh, of uh, overall right protection and you never talk about dignity, security, non-violence, non-discrimination, unless you step into the field of labor, you step into the field of healthcare, you step into the field of education, and you show how even in the societies where we have so many unregulated issues, they have a different burden on more like discriminated uh, groups of the society. Uh, so disproportionate impact, even in the case of overall uh, non-regulation or problems should be made visible by us, by uh, different groups of women. Uh, I, I, I also want to mention that all the issues I'm talking about much need to be looked about at from the intersectional perspective. And if I carry on and look at those labor challenges that I mentioned about from the perspective of women with disabilities, from the perspective of transgender women, for the perspective of elderly women, we will see even uh, much, much more of a burden and much less chances to tackle those issues. So, um, I don't want to take much time, but uh, really thank you to thank you for pinpointing these issues. Thank you, Anahit. Actually, on that note, I would like to read uh, Tamar Shirinian's comment. Uh, she says, 100% on the social economic rights. We also cannot talk about the shift from Soviet to post-Soviet without talking about capitalism and its extreme violences. And on that, actually, as a follow-up, to Anahit and, and uh, Maro and Judy's comments. Uh, I also think that um, because we should address the, 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 brut the brutal violence, neoliberal policies, neoliberal politics in every sphere of life uh, is uh, really turning our lives into like uh, turning 
uh, the country and the world into an inhabitable place for uh, many vulnerable communities and, and populations and uh, making more and more populations and communities uh, vulnerable. Uh, I think this intersectional perspective that we are using as a, as a lens of analysis should also be used for our solidarities. Uh, I want to note, I really loved, I almost teared up uh, when I heard the conversation between Anaid and Maro, that's the, the, the spirit of solidarity that will save us. And that solidarity should always also be intersectional, as Anahit said. Um, the more we can recruit people um, who are made vulnerable by these policies um, into our movement, uh, the more, the further we will go in terms of both gender uh, justice and uh, justice in other fields of like environmental and um, labor. Uh, I, I have just one last uh, uh, remark, just back to the question about the unions. Uh, there is this very interesting fact because um, another big chunk of the research uh, uh, that I was mentioning about was dealing with uh, the protection of the rights of domestic workers. And this is a group of workers that is not covered by legislation and they're mostly working in formal sector and globally uh, women tend to be the majority in certain types of domestic uh, with doing being the majority employers in, uh, uh, in the certain types of domestic workers but anyway so we we're looking at uh, also the chances for labor unions to bring up uh, the issues of domestic workers in Armenia and what we discovered was that the first union uh, officially registered of Armenia was actually the union of domestic workers of Yerevan and this is also sort uh, sort of um, knowledge, uh, so, sort of collective knowledge that we somehow lost about uh, our um, past, uh, about achievements uh, in, in, in that past as, as women, as, as uh, workers, uh, as, as uh, people who have uh, common causes to unite. And I also very much value keeping these links, uh, the memory links between generations and phases of, of development of the country. I guess there's you know, another conference theme here uh, the, the, about the transition and, uh, you know, pros and cons, because I also remember... I that also love you, Tamar, sorry. Tamar, sorry <laughs> trying <asked> to, <laughs> when as educators, you know, university professors, we were trying to get unionized, there was a terrible backlash against that, uh, which is also, uh, oh, yeah, very uncommon. Um, no. Sorry, Maru. But uh, Melissa, I just think this really underscores the importance of coalition building. And I will try to put in the, um, some links to stories where environmentalists got together with union folks around toxics that were both a threat to the community as well as to the workers and trying to find where self-interest was in common. Until the coalitions get bigger, sometimes you're a voice crying in the wilderness. And this gets to the long game and the short game. And it's why in the absence of what we would call enlightened policymakers and leaders, and Maro just underscored how we have departments that don't even talk to each other. But even when we do have a department of children and families, as I can tell you, we do in some states in the United States, where they are bringing in the interests of, you know, the children, the mothers, the families, they still don't get the progressive policies unless you have an outside force. And this gets to changing the attitudes in the community or in whatever setting where we are so that we will then build up a movement that wants different policymakers, that will have a different electoral process. Ultimately, it's the people we elect and the leaders that count. And building up that community voice that will then change who the leaders are is gonna require those who have the bully pulpit in the meantime. And that's why I really love Dave Zirin's book and his stories about athletes who step up to the plate. Well, there are people in, um, you know, who are actors, who are singers, who have a bully pulpit Pit, if we can get them on board and they would at least capture some of the narrative in the public marketplace so people will think, well, maybe way I've been thinking about this issue all along doesn't make sense. And we have the story of organized domestic workers in some parts of the United States. I can think of New York City where they had successes because they brought in other activists. It wasn't just the women who were um, in these unbearable circumstances of work. And it's building these coalitions in the long run that will change electoral politics, change our leaders, and then change the policies. 
Okay, Mara was saying something. I will uh, uh, give the floor to her. And then there is one question by Professor Armin Marsupian about the Istanbul Convention, but I think we uh, ran uh, out of time. I, I don't know how we are doing, Megan. Should we? We can uh, we can address the question. We have a little bit of wiggle room today. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Mara and then the Istanbul Convention question. I don't have anything. I agree with oh, whatever was said. Uh, you were saying something. I told you cut. Uh, you. Yeah. No, no. no? Uh, okay. Okay. Then, um, what are the prospects for the ratification of the Istanbul Convention in Armenia? What position has the government taken now that the women's quota been met in the parliament? How has the uh, backtracking in Turkey with the convention been reported in Armenia? Anna, do you want to talk about that? You must definitely start, Maro. <laughs> well, I want to say that um, we were very, very hopeful uh, post-revolution that the Istanbul Convention will be ratified. We, we, are, we signed it, but we did not ratify it. Um, then there was, um, uh, you know, the opposition in this country, and I guess in all countries, if I can, they they um, they dominate or they uh, take that space of ignorance and they can uh, uh, run campaigns that uh, to spread panic, to spread fear, to, you know, uh, that deals with ignorance of people. So one of the campaigns that they took early on uh, post-revolution was not to ratify the Istanbul Convention. It will destroy families. We know the whole thing, um, and um, and you know the opposition that was on Bagramian uh, Avenue uh, for for a month or so. Uh, one of the speakers was saying that okay, what Pashinyan did, he destroyed uh, the army, he destroyed the church, he destroyed families. And uh, now uh, wants to bring the Istanbul Convention. I mean, th those are the arguments that you would hear in the streets. So, um, yeah, there was a strong campaign against that. Unfortunately, uh, the government that we have is a populist government and very much listens to what the flow is in the in 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 the discourse of people and what what's going on on Facebook. Unfortunately, and um, and, and I have to say the post-war also, uh, the last I've heard is that there are other priorities than ratifying the Istanbul Convention. So um, right now, um, I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's an issue, uh, but we will, not, uh, we will not be silenced by this. I mean, we, we're gonna continue and we can do something in parallel that bring our legislation to be a bit closer to the Istanbul Convention and, um, and compensate with it in that respect. Um, of course, the Istanbul Convention will uh, imply more uh, obligations by the state, but, um, and for those who do not know what the Istanbul Convention is, this is the Council of Europe uh, Convention Against uh, Gender-Based Violence that was signed in Istanbul and Turkey recently um, mm -hmm. reneged it. Um, we did not really talk about that that much in, in this country about that. Um, and we don't want to bring out uh, aspects of other countries that are trying to not adhere to the Istanbul Convention. <laughs> so, we, so we don't influence it <laughs> even more. But um, yeah, it's unfortunate. And, but it's one of the things that you have to struggle for. I mean, nothing comes easy. Uh, we don't we don't achieve anything by waiting for it. We have to scream and yell and kick, and that's when things happen. It's as Judy said, when people get together and fight for it, and they create labor unions and they create uh, activism. And uh, to tell you frankly, we as in the coalition many times we had protests in front of ministries or in front in, in front of courts, and that's when things started to move. Uh, otherwise, it's nobody. Nothing comes directly from the government to advance a cause. Uh, all I know is always public pressure and activism. 
Thank you. Uh, Anahid, would you like to reflect on? Um, since I completely agree with Mario, um, uh, I would just like to um, uh, connect this question with uh, the lessons learned from other countries, for example, of other countries, because there was such a question and maybe the overall um, gender hysteria um, pattern that I you talked about yesterday. Um, so uh, definitely uh, the, the fuss about or, or the, um, uh, the fear around, or I don't know, the anti-campaigns around Istanbul Convention is not something that is unique to Armenia. And uh, it's been something that countries in Europe were facing as well. Uh, and the narratives are quite similar when you look at the experiences. Uh, and I think uh, on one hand, this uh, leads to, to the idea of how global uh, tendencies and more global right wing tendencies uh, impact every single country, no matter big or small, or at least every country which tries to um, go forward for the change, which tries to uh, resist uh, those uh, right-wing or more conservative uh, tendencies. And I would just like maybe to deviate from the question, but my, my what I have in my mind right now, that for, for a small country like Armenia, I'm always fascinated how, um, how we still manage uh, in, in really quite challenging circumstances and overall challenging environment where we're living in, not to agree with narratives or uh, ideologies that are oppressive, that are limiting, that are discriminatory, that are violent, even if uh, this is about uh, rather small groups of the society, but this is really pressures uh, and uh, maybe it's not happening in, a, in, in one day or in one night and people are suffering really, as, as Mara said, no one comes, everything comes at a price. And I think Melissa, you know, best of us, how this come uh, at a price, the Istanbul Convention, anti-Istanbul Conventions campaign come at a price for your students. Um, this was a very outrageous incident that was when a student was beaten up by anti-Istanbul protester. Um, so this, these things happen. And this is the price that is being paid by different groups of the society, even by those who won't be seen maybe at the front lines of, for instance, uh, women's rights um, activist circles or, or um, more like visible uh, part of, of, of us. There are also people, young generation or older. I, I saw people on Bahramian that I never knew, never heard of them, who were passing by, standing uh, in front of these men. And there are only men protesting the convention, obviously. And there were genuinely angrily asking them, like, what do you want? We read that uh, convention, there was nothing to fear in that. And why do you create all this, uh, all this fuss about that? And they would even get into, into really like verbal fight with them. So I think everyone does their portion sometimes and very often people do their, uh, they, they, they have their share in, in the common battle. And this is very important in the society like ours and maybe in, in all of that. Yeah, yeah no, but and I, I want to mention that um, those people who are collecting signature against the Istanbul Convention that you mentioned on Bagramian, mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, you know, it's not because they don't believe in the. Uh, yes, it's because they are they, part of the. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. They yeah. they yeah. were there as as agents of those who wanted to. Yeah do an action against the establishment, mm -hmm. against the government. And uh, nobody reads uh, laws. Nobody understands exactly what Soros is. But you know they pick up these formulas, Istanbul Convention, Soros, you know, and they create this hysteria and panic. But people don't understand what it is about, but they think that it's a bad thing, you know? So this is how they use it because they don't have other arguments of criticism and it's the easiest formula, it's a simple thing to say, for people to capture and create around it a whole discourse against the government or against the uh, uh, European values and things like that. Wow. Uh, on that note, I, I have to close this panel, but the next panel will really like follow up give uh, a little bit more context to and will showcase how 
all this is happening uh, also with the background of collective trauma, uh, both historical, we talked about it uh, yesterday and um, during and after the Artsakh war. So, and how uh, women's organizations are fighting the, the effects of the war uh, on the society, the, 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 the models work with um, rising numbers of domestic uh, violence victims and also tremendous efforts that I witnessed and tried to take part in uh, women's organizations uh, in um, providing organized aid uh, for the survivors. Uh, basically bringing people, uh, saving lives and bringing people um, back to some sort of uh, normalcy and the role of women's organizations in, um, in uh, extending a helping hand uh, in an organized way, uh, massive uh, aid work for, for the survivors. So uh, I, I'll close the panel here and please don't go anywhere after the uh, break, we'll, have, we'll follow up on, this, on these questions. Thank you so much. Amazing presentation. Yes, yes, we'll take a 10 minute break. Um, so stick around for the panelists up right now. I'm going to transfer you as attendees so you can watch the next panel. Um, and I will make sure that all of the panelists that are now attendees are moved over to be panelists. So I'll do that. And please stretch your legs, refill your coffee or your water, and we'll see you in 10 minutes. Thank you again.
Hi, Megan. <laughs> I was muted there. Hi, Hurik. <laughs> Sorry, I was muted before. <laughs> Hi, Karina. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Good to see you. Okay. So welcome back, everyone. And thank you for joining us for our final panel of this two-day conference, War, Trauma, and Displacement, Gender, and Building Peace. I have the pleasure of introducing our panel chair for this afternoon's session, Professor Huri Gatarian. Huri Gatarian is Associate Professor at the American University of Armenia, and she teaches cour courses in education and oral history. She has obtained her PhD from the Faculty of Education, McGill University, and she's a core member of the Center for Oral History and Digital Storytelling at Concordia University in Montreal. Visual arts-based uh, methodologies are a core facet in her research endeavors and her work focuses on story, storying memory and identity through visual and narrative explorations. Her research creation projects draw together difficult memories and marginalized histories of violence within a framework of public pedagogy. Professor Tarian, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you so much, Megan. And uh, I want to thank the Zorian Institute and all the other supporting entities for organizing this important and timely conference actually at this, uh, I would say, historical juncture uh, in our lives. And uh, listening to the panels yesterday and today uh, makes the argument for the necessity of having a strong gender, uh, a strong agenda on gender issues and coalition building. I'm borrowing this from what Judy Norsegian just said in the previous panel, in various fields from education uh, to health, to policymaking, to law, uh, to politics and beyond, all the more imperative in the post-Soviet landscape of Armenia. And in this very last panel, uh, the presentations will bring us back to what we have been dealing with in full force yet again uh, in this past year, namely war, trauma and displacement, gender and peace building. Um, so uh, after the panels, uh, obviously we will have a, a question and answer. So please use uh, the question and answer forum for your questions. Uh, you may also use the chat if you like. And uh, we'll start with our very first panelist, uh, Nona Shahnazarian. Uh, Nona is a social anthropologist and a senior a research fellow at the Institute of Archaeology and Ethnography at the, National, at the National Academy of Sciences in Yerevan, Armenia. She's also affiliated with the Center for Independent Social Research in St. Petersburg, Russia. In 2017, she was a visiting Carnegie Fellow at the University of Stanford. She has published extensively on issues of gender, war, migration, memory, and diaspora in the Caucasus, including a book chapter titled National Ideologies, Survival Strategies, and Gender Identity in the Political and Symbolic Context of a Karapal War, as well as a monograph in Russian titled In the Tight Embrace of Tradition, War and Patriarchy. Her most recent contribution on the Republic of Armenia with Christine Kavukian was issued in the Palgrave Handbook of Women's Political Rights. She has run the regional office of the Women in War think tank in Yerevan since 2015. Uh, Nona uh, Shahnazarian's presentation title is uh, Nagorno Karabakh Wars and Gender Transformations, Displacement, Trauma, and Widowhood. Uh, I cede the screen to you, uh, dear Nona. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Rick. Uh, I'm trying to... Uh, 
Can you see it now? Yes. Thank you. Um, this is my great pleasure uh, to be with you today. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, and uh, my topic is actually uh, the st status uh, disempowerment or empowerment of women in war affected and war torn areas, areas, specifically in de facto, in the de facto Nagorno Karabakh Republic. Original ethnic conflicts are known uh, to are known to affect um, and transform the structure of social institutions and gender relations. The experience of a blood as before uh, uh, redesigned and strongly affected the water and societies, including also the, the participation of women in pol politics. Uh, I therefore intend to see specifically how war affects such empowerment processes. I'm interested in the impact of war on the power of, power of women uh, due to uh, the following. We know that uh, at times of war, women are equal with men, with all the vertical power um, crashing into horizontal. However, when war is over, the opposite occurs. The horizontal power turns into the vertical where the patriarchal pyramid erect itself yet again. The latter presents itself as a rather oppressive case since uh, once equal members of a community are ignored and looked down on. This is of particular importance in the context of, of the Nagorno-Karabakh Republic as some sort of historical abrasion appears to have taken place in the aftermath of the ethnic war. As it appears, for some reason, the usual international uh, scenario when women are neglected after war has not uh, happened uh, because relatively many women have obtained high rank state positions. Uh, positions. For what I intend to study is whether such historic collaboration did indeed take place, and if yes, what are the uh, rationales for, uh, rationales for such historical breakthrough. Um, other than that, I want to understand how women, uh, women empowerment affects uh, transformative social uh, change uh, in society. Uh, my first section is uh, about the, a return to tradition if it is, if at all. Uh, the Karabakh war became a tangible breaking point in the people's construction of time and the identity in which the shape of a new post-communist political culture was born. An extremely romanticized notion of national brotherhood served as a catalyst arousing new social energies. Uh, the components of the new political cultures that emerged consisted of a um, combination of reinforced neo-traditionalism and neoliberal discourse and practice. Specifically the new, uh, uh, specifically the renewal of uh, all the patriarchal models of communal relationships became an optimal strategy for resistance and victory. Uh, the, uh, the reinstatement uh, re of uh, philosophy that valued a um, quote-unquote return to, to the village and reliance on extended family became the prim primary formula for survival. The transgressions of gender roles, including the rise of female fighters, was the second opposing strategy by which all resources were mobilized for victory. Par paradoxically or dialectically, however, such practices also served to reinforce traditional ideologies of male domination. And transformations of family structure uh, is um, actually, um, uh, it's, that is to say that despite the uh, urbanization and modernization that occurred during the Soviet 
era, the Karabakh Armenian population maintained uh, throughout this time a special and respectful attitude toward historical and rural tradition. During the war, however, this respect for tradition became a simple, a simple uh, survival formula. While the war and ensuing social disaster provided uh, the residents of Karabakh with a different perception of the world and a heightened sense of their ethnic roots and unity, uh, there emerged an acute need for a strict adjustment of life strategies aimed at long-term survival. Individual interests were sh uh, um, shoved uh, aside in the pursuit of group survival. The constant conflict between individual, individual interests and the ethics of duty was resolved in favor of, of the latter. In this environment, kinship-based relationships of responsibility and dependency were um, endowed with almost mystical significance. In Soviet time, the existing, existing patriarchal system in Nagorno-Karabakh, like elsewhere, had been marginalized as state ideology promoted female emancipation, emancipation and industrialization. The war pushed Karabakh Armenian society back toward its uh, pre-Soviet patriarchal order. When the region's town were bombarded by Azerbaijani uh, artillery and aircraft, whole families escaped to half-deserted mountainous villages, which were difficult uh, targets. The Karabakh Armenian uh, urban population, which had come to take pride in its urbanized lifestyle, was forced to regroup into extended family units and revert to the peasant traditions of the mountain village. By doing so, they managed to achieve a maximum economy of resources. Uh, as a result of the pressure of the Karabakh, both family structures changed, reflected in a shift from small nuclear families to large patriarchal one, which several men in, in charge who collectively cared for these extended families were not away for military action uh, or guard duty. Wartime chaos and post-war disorganization put such strains on the institution of the nuclear family that such structure structures were almost impossible to sustain. Uh, in their stead arose blood ties and the functional social network based upon them. Within uh, a discourse of nationalism, all the Armenians of Karabakh became coherently tied to one another. Um, uh, in, in this context, can we speak about post-war empowerment of women? At the same time, the women of Nagorno-Karabakh took on multiple roles during the Karabakh Wars. Well, while the war uh, shifted the social structure of this, I mean, the first war uh, of the community towards, toward traditionalism, some women did acquire new non-traditional female roles either by choice or by force, in, uh, in both cases justified by the discourse of national defense uh, and unity. For some, uh, the national battle developed into a romantic concept. According to official and un unofficial data, some, some 100 uh, women were directly involved in the Karabakh war, of which 17 were killed and 16 disabled. Some women after the war also uh, came to hold positions in national government, including uh, as ministers of health. Despite this sense of progression, women who violated stereotypical roles were considered dangerous upstarts. Even though they swore and drank like men and with men and were given high praises such as being called a Tagamartkanek, literally man-woman in, in, in dialect, these women were ultimately rejected. They were considered as 
quote unquote one of the men, but only temporarily and not completely. In such cases, a woman, the woman pays too heavy a price for the honor uh, of being accepted into a male brotherhood. Uh, from a sexual object and the role of a caregiver that is socially recognized and uh, protected by traditional culture, she turns into a non-systemic semi-component. This constitutes a dual marginalization of women. In the traditional role, women are bound to and marginalized by domesticity. Fighting um, side by side with men in counteract this marginalization and domesticity, uh, but it still doesn't result in the coveted social status, status of equality. On the contrary, uh, counteracting the patriarchy actually marginalizes these sorts of um, women even more. In the end, female soldiers were tolerated during the war only to be denounced again afterwards. The war led to a transgression of conventional relationships between the sexes, but an uh, essentialized system of thought about gender roles persisted. Extreme emotional tension and constant risk and danger, coupled with the idea of the nation as a horizontal brotherhood uh, fighting for national survival, made possible unusual male-female relationships and role inversions. Still, the direct inclusion of gender policy on the national agenda was deli deliberately avoided. This was justified by the claim that addressing the consequences of war on gender relations would put a strain on national unity. Based uh, as it was um, on patriarchy. Thus, nation building in Nagorno-Karabakh uh, a process that resumed with vigor um, after uh, the passing of socialism has been accompanied by conflict at the intersection of ethnicity and gender, or rather a clash of tradition um, slash patriarchy and modernization slash feminism or uh, female empowerment. This conflict is reflected um, very clearly in a statement by uh, Jeanne Galstian, uh, an ex-presidential advisor on cultural issues. In response to, to my question about what she thinks uh, of uh, women's solidarity in the region, uh, Galstian with a poorly concealed in the Indignation replied with another question. Why divide the nation into men and women? Um, um, uh, my next section is uh, my next section is uh, about uh, widowhood. Um, one second, I, I want to. Uh, I want to show you next slide, if I may. Um, can you see next slide? No, we're still on the first slide. Uh, uh -huh. One second. Okay, that's just a, a picture by uh, Edmond Petrosian, uh, exactly about widows. Uh, so, um, gender roles, uh, traditional gender roles in particular, receive heightened attention during wars and in post conflict societies. They serve as symbolic boundaries of the nation in the nationalist discourse. Mothers, wives, and daughters signify the nation and national belonging. They are perceived as the property of the nation. War widows in Nagorno-Karabakh today represent powerful symbols 
of patriotism, uh, since in most cases their husbands uh, sacrificed uh, their lives in the 1990s war uh, or in more recent years, the killed in combat service along the border of Karabakh or, or in recent war. The Karabakh authorities recognize this symbolism in the form of monthly state pension. Yet this financial support from the government can also produce resentment in a widow's immediate neighborhood, and thus generates considerable social expectation that a widow will honor appropriately the great achievement of her fallen husband. Hence, according to patriarchal uh, norms... Nona John, maybe if you just change it into the slideshow aspect of it, if you click the slideshow, it will help you... Uh, change um, the slides. Uh, don't worry, I have yeah. only okay. six slides, mm -hmm. so I, uh, we can just skip. Uh, thank you. The great achievement of her fallen husband, and hence, according to patriarchal norms, widowhood demands further sacrifice. Suddenly, widows face a diminished um, status as they have uh, lost their master, idiomatically speaking, Darchonim in, in dialect, or are left without, without their owner, under Anderandereumanatsal, or pitifully are considered headless with women. Glocha Katarvatska Negya. In short, all these linguistic phrases allude to the patriarchal norm of a complete family where the father is the head of the family, and uh, the breadwinner. Um, thanks to the relatively generous state pension, war widows in Karabakh uh, uh, are not or used to be not actively affected by extreme poverty as they are in other countries. In Karabakh society, three factors determine the next life, uh, life stage of widows uh, motherhood, patriarchality and strict social control. Many of the widows interviewed became largely dependent on their husband's family after his death. Some war widows consider remarriage as a strategy that widows used to reintegrate into society by achieving once, once more the status of married woman. Um, However, for widows in Karabakh, this strategy is not as straightforward uh, as it might seem. While one choice is that of remarrying as a result of finding a new, a new love, a new husband, the other choice is a, a liberal marriage. This is anthropological term, uh, which I'm going to uh, not explain, but talk about. The war in Nagorno-Karabakh left many women widowed and their chances for a new marriage were practically equal to zero, mostly because of enormous casualties. It was the post-war chaos and the economic crisis that helped to bring back the ubiquitous practices, the practice of liberal, marrying one's brother's widow, the form of marriage which facilitated facilitates the survival and family reproduction under extreme circumstances. In such situations, the institution of marriage becomes, um, I'm quoting, one of the participate, participating sides of a complex system of economic and other interactions between two families or two clans. End of quote. Um, this is quote, this is quite clear, quote. This tradition is often explained as an expression of patrilineality, which suggests that a married woman is perceived as a property of the husband and eternally linked to him, even after his death. Libera, on the other hand, provides a legitimate resolution uh, to the problem of widow. This practice was used extensively before the Solitization, as well as during the restless times of the Bolshevik Revolution and the Great Patriotic War of 1941-1945, part of World War II. 
By the beginning of Karabakh War, this ancestral practice was almost forgotten. However, the war revived the successful forgotten custom. Liberal marriages, while facing some resistance from those getting into wedlock, still became common in the post-war Karabakh society. Liberal in, in Karabakh presents a legitimate and accepted solution to the loneliness of the status of widows. However, he, this doesn't mean that the uh, revival was accepted without any criticism from the individuals affected by it. On one of my slides, there is a piece of uh, interview, excerpts from interview. I can send you if you are interested later. Uh, and therefore, if, if, if the first and I'm quoting, if the first and immediate function of a matrimonial strategy consists in acquiring means of reproduction of the king, then the strategy also has to provide uh, uh, the maintenance of inheritance and uh, integrity, especially in an economic universe where money is a rarity. And this is a quotation by the viewer. Uh, uh, sociologist, and according to the specific logic of family interactions, family interactions, a younger son, younger brother, brings super investment into the family, often sacrificing uh, his siblings for the sake of the family. There were consistent rumors in the city that uh, he might uh, might interview uh, this A guy dated a young woman, but they were forced to break up. I'm not sure if it would be relevant to talk about exploitation by the family in this particular case or about uh, exercising family power over individuals, for, for there was no direct pressure. The protagonist himself, this A guy, didn't admit to the violation of his interests, but because of uh, because this was a long, longitudinal study, later on in the uh, in 20 years, he actually was complaining that uh, no, Najan, may I ask that you start concluding since? Sure, sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Uh, and actually, I wanted to, to speak about drone war, which certainly brought new dimensions to narratives on the masculinities and especially to the militarized hegemonic one. As though this is a subtopic to be investigated, and I'm on my way of doing that. So I will skip this. And my concluding remarks is a little bit kind of uh, connected to my introduction. Just reiterate that women's political engagement in the Nagoya Karabakh Republic uh, previously, now, on, and now it's in such an uncertainty, was an, at the peak at the end of the 1990s. More women with ministerial position than men, according to Armenia Alexanian uh, from Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, back to Nagorno Karabakh, a republic more than six women to ministerial portfolios, including the Ministry of Justice and Health. Once again, whether it's possible to link these indicators with the active participation of women in the war, can it be stated that military involvement transformed after the war into political status as a visible and tangible result of social recognition of women? women's uh, contribution. The analysis of the gender dynamics in Karabakh reveals that while women are formally granted access to power, this access takes place under the control of men. Auxiliary is uh, a key uh, descriptive world, uh, world here. This issue should not be viewed only with the lens of competition between men and women. It's obvious that women are um, beginners in polit politics, and they certainly need, need a system a systematic training and social resources that would allow them to overcome the structural impediment towards 
impediments toward, towards political experience. Political activity surely requires special skills and professionalism. However, the current male-dominated political arena doesn't stand out by these characteristics. A prolonged closed political arena that has hindered the uh, acquisition and practice of these skills among women serves as an ex excuse for further exclusion. And now, even when a woman is allowed into politics, uh, whether for visibility or for real participation, she often performs the traditional role that cling to her, quote unquote. So uh, a woman's political participation is often manifested in her work on cultural issues as an important link in passing down traditional and national values, healthcare uh, to perform the prescribed gender role of an actor providing care for the sick in the family and in the country, and in education, fulfilling the role of teacher of her own and all the other children. This transfer of private roles into the public sphere consistently receives public approval. Since this transfer doesn't challenge the stereotypical perception of um, quote unquote, purely women's role, the inertia of thinking in old frames is not disrupted. When it comes to leading the country, a cognitive dissonance arises. It's not a woman, woman's virtue. Historically, it works out this way, and there is no need to break the order. And this is what is said, actually. Therefore, one can conclude that the inertia and resistance of customary law, adat, adat, in dialect, to formal law remains very significant. The main conclusions can be summarized uh, as follows. Soviet-style feminism and the indoctrination of communist ideas with the purposeful aim to, to bend the traditionalist way of life have led to con conflicting results. On the one hand, the Soviet strategy strongly invited women to the labor, public, and political spheres. Um, and on the other, it failed to meet the household needs of women or alleviate uh, their burden. Despite certain drawbacks, gender quotas are an important strategy necessary for the formation of a balanced pattern of political representation. It can be concluded that in the Soviet period, when women were pushed out of the public and political spheres, despite their active participation in the national movement, they had to take the available and residual niche in the NGOs. Thus, the current state of the civil society, among other things, reflects the specificity of the gender competition for a place in the political arena. I'm, uh, I'm sorry for abusing time. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much, Nona. Uh, Nona, you have such a decades long work in this field. And I do understand that uh, trying to kind of bring everything together um, uh, sometimes it's like very, very hard. Um, thank you uh, so much. Um, Okay, so we will now move on into the informational uh, side of the war with our second panelist, uh, Karina Avedisian. Uh, Karina uh, is a, a PhD in political science and her work focuses on popular geopolitics and, and, and new media and communications in Eurasia. Uh, Karina's work on the interplay of authoritarianism, societal vulnerabilities, and civil society has been published in academic publications and in The Guardian. She's a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. Um, Karina's um, a presentation today is titled Women and Embodied Experiences of War, Positionality of the Activist Scholar. Um, on to you, Karina. Thank you, Harik. Um... Yeah, so this presentation focuses on my embodied experience in online and social media advocacy around the 2020 Artsakh War, both as a scholar activist and as an Armenian woman. I discuss what it means to be on the front lines of the informational side of the war with a reflection on the challenges facing scholars and activists from marginalized identities engaging with conflict. 
And in particular, I'll focus on gender and ethnicity as these are the most salient identities for me in this context. But I also want to acknowledge that there are other identities, including sexuality, gender identity, ability and class that are also important here. Um, and an analysis of which would be, would greatly enrich the field. So I'll begin by kind of explicating my, my self description. Um, I'm an ethnic Armenian and an Armenian citizen, which means most, if not all Western gatekeepers, including my scholar peers, perceive me as an insider Armenian. Yet I'm also an outsider because I've spent most of my life outside Armenia. I have other citizenships and the option of leaving Armenia where I live now if I want. And it's not my family going to the front lines, even if my students and acquaintances are. I'm an Armenian woman, which means I deal with misogyny as a person with a public profile, not only from hostile Turks and Azeris in the context of the conflict, but also from academic peers and from the Armenian community. And finally, I'm a scholar activist because I'm an academic who takes an explicitly political standpoint in my work. Mainstream scholars are often critical of political stances, although at its heart, all research is political. And these critics are certainly not asking what systems they are actively upholding. A major tension I've experienced as a political scientist researching oppressive power and state violence are the prevailing assumptions in my field that there exists one objective Archimedean point from which one can know the world. But I know from my own life that my scholarship is perceived differently because of my situatedness and my identity. Critical theory, on the other hand, makes visible restrictions of gender, class, ethnicity, and so on. Um, feminist standpoint theory in particular calls on those who have not had access to power and areas of decision making to participate in the construction of social reality. This is my answer to that call, and it is one that I hope will encourage other scholars, activists, and writers with marginalized identities to use their voice in calling truth to power. And here I must say that while social media has made the speaking back possible, it also makes me a target for abuse and that even though I continue to speak out, I also continue to experience feelings of anxiety and exposure. This work is not just an abstract philosophical debate for me. Um, it's psychologically and emotionally draining, especially given my social position relative to other, let's say white male experts. And this burden is not captured by traditional political science. My experience in online advocacy around the recent war on Twitter has sparked thinking about what gets turned into history and which versions become canon and, embedded, and embed themselves as part of the collective consciousness. Who has the privilege to even be heard and whose version of reality matters? I was suddenly confronted with how my voice, even as a scholar, was being actively constrained by oppressive structures and actors in efforts to maintain the privilege of defining reality. Let me give an example. Azerbaijan, as the aggressor in this war, hugely benefited from Western media's false equivalent, which obscured their responsibility for the aggression. It was this structural environment that allowed many experts to denounce Armenian acts of defense as violent. Armenian strikes on Azerbaijan were the first time many explicitly called out the violence, denouncing the quote, escalation when they ignored the fact that cluster bombs and missiles were already being fired at Armenian civilians for a week or two. When I called out the people engaging in this selective outrage, pointing out that we were well into a war that Azerbaijan launched, I was met either with silence or with groups of their supporters telling me I'm wrong. And it must be said, denouncing the violence of Armenian defense cannot happen without relying on distorted constructions of power. It ignores the fact that violence is already here and it ignores who is most affected by that violence. Often virtue signaling as pacifism, this sentiment is itself a form of violence as it requires oppressed people to suffer quietly under an inconceivably greater brutality. And this was the moment that the space between myself and my Western peers suddenly became a gulf. The violence of these Western constructions of reality extended to deeming Armenian voices as incapable of rationality, even as these supposedly objective experts repeatedly got it wrong. In February, I gave a talk to the Zoravik activist collective about media manipulation during the war, and I pointed out how Western experts often obscured the power asymmetry between the Armenian side and the Azerbaijani-Turkish tandem, which together absolutely dwarf Armenia. 
right? These are facts that I'm repeating. Yet after my talk, a Western expert on the region, someone I know personally, emailed the moderator of my panel to take issue with that point, using it to assert that my talk was, quote, not academic. Why would this white man who has only a stake in this conflict as an analyst be so provoked by my presentation of facts to write to the moderator to correct me, if not because his privileged position as the arbiter of truth was being challenged? This Western indifference and dismissal, including from my now former peers and acquaintances, was happening simultaneously to a huge volume of hate speech from hostile Turks and Nazarians online, including threats of more genocide and the posting of graphic videos of Armenian death. This was a legitimately traumatizing dynamic. In fact, preparing for this talk, I wanted to access a private exchange that I had had with a German scholar acquaintance of mine for whom I'd done a favor in the past, but I could not. She had defended thinly veiled genocide denialism and then called me aggressive when I said that I was glad to at least know where she stood. And I still can't look at this exchange because I can't confront that not only was my own human pain totally insignificant to her, but that the authority she was asserting was constituted by the absence of my voice and her ability to dismiss my voice as unimportant, just to reinforce the structure that she benefits from, even as the Armenian death that I was arguing was continuing. Was continuing. So there is a certain hypocrisy of Western analysts who pretend to speak for civilization, but who undercut our voices. In this culture of domination, we're often fooled by the illusion of free speech, believing we can say whatever we want in an atmosphere of openness. But there would be no need to speak if there weren't mechanisms of silencing. The absence of a critical but humane response from experts outside the Armenian community has had an enormously detrimental effect on those of us who do speak. That is why for us, continuing to speak out is not just an expression of intellectual power. It is an act of resistance and a political act that not only attempts to set the record straight, but challenges the politics of domination that otherwise render us voiceless. Because when almost all the authoritative works on the conflict and our lives in the context of the conflict are written by non-Armenians, we see how those who dominate treat us as objects, defining our reality, recreating our identity, and naming our history only in ways that define our relationship to them. And this is the authority that I critique. Often this domination was so overt and grotesque that I began to engage in deliberate acts of irreverence towards authority figures. I would sometimes give them silly nicknames and swear at them. And the reactions were revealing. My conduct was tone policed on the one hand by Armenians, usually men, who saw me as an insider of the Western expert class and that I was betraying my peers and making the Armenian community look bad. And on the other hand, by the same Western expert class who pointed to that approach to justify their dismissal of my position. Reflecting with the US-based colleague about our motivations for doing this work, she explained that it is the urge to resist erasure, which she sees as the direct legacy of genocide because this is more about more than lost lives. It's about lost history, including history which has been willfully erased by Turkey and Azerbaijan, enabled by Western power brokers. That's what makes this current battle so important. It's about feeling the injustice, letting it motivate you, and then going in and pushing back to say, we do not consent to these versions of us. Bell Hooks said that speaking about our lives the lives of the historically oppressed brings together, quote, the idea, the theory and shared personal experience, which is the moment when the abstract becomes concrete, tangible, something can, people can hold and carry with them. It is listening to and honoring that personal experience and treating it as, a, as legitimate and authoritative. And this is not just for the sake of feeling good, it's how theory, scholarship and knowledge is developed. And so speaking out about the feelings of pain around dehumanization, loss, exile, and erasure becomes a critical site of this conflict. It becomes a space for the struggle of memory against forgetting. The expectation of sort of neutral scholarly objectivity in the face of this work is dangerous also because it is so hollow, especially when it comes to the horrors of war. Scholar Elizabeth Dauphiné's book, The Politics of Exile on the Bosnian War, which I recommend very much, 
forces the reader to consider the futility of a detached objective approach to conflict. Her message is important for us too, as it asks how as researchers, we access the lives and deaths of people with whom we often share very little in common and what social science does and for whom. It is one of the few works of international relations that challenges the idea that war, violence and human misery can be grasped by a detached objective scholar because analyzing the world with no idea of what's good or bad, relevant or trivial, true or false is literally impossible. Audre Lorde warned that, quote, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. In other words, it's much easier for oppressed groups to become complicit in structures of domination. If we allow our audience to be determined by the powerful, it becomes easy for the marginal voice who wants to be heard to say what they want to hear and to define experiences in ways that reinforce their domination. There are many examples of Armenian scholars who do this and are rewarded with inclusion in the halls of power. My hope in engaging in this work is to open up the space for other marginalized people, and especially Armenians and Armenian women, to act as subjects capable of defining their own reality, to encourage them to value their own point of view and speak from the authority of their lived experience, to call out and resist being treated like objects and to feel empowered to withdraw consent from others' definitions of us. This was an embodied experience. And although I was not physically on the front lines and cannot and will not compare my experience to that of soldiers, I was physically and mentally impacted. My health suffered. My identity was publicly kind of throttled by others. On the one hand, by the white, mostly male peers who saw me as an insolent ethnic who dared challenge their favorite, their, their favorite expert. And on the other hand, for the insider Armenians who saw me as an outsider and who perhaps to some degree took my took for granted my empoweredness to speak back and saw my irreverence as kind of double crossing the power brokers they saw me in the same class as. I was simultaneously extremely visible on social media and yet made invisible. No one asked me how I saw myself. I'll end by leaving us with some questions. How does our personhood become another battleground in this larger fight? How can we better acknowledge how researchers, scholars, and activists are often unacknowledged frontline workers? At the end of the day, our bodies and our intellect are being used. And this is about embodied knowledge and embodied work, which is at the heart of feminism. It's been a year since this conflict, and this is the first time I'm even considering these questions, um, which I think are relevant, not only for this conflict, but for the scholarship overall. And it's my hope that we start accounting for a bigger, more holistic picture of conflict and war that accommodates all these different experiences. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Karina, for this really powerful uh, testimonial, almost testimonial narrative of how we live this insider outsider schism. Thank you for that. Um, our uh, third panelist uh, is unable to join us today, uh, Gilnara uh, Shahinyan, but I still want to read her bio before we move on to our fourth panelist. Um, and uh, uh, Gilnara has a health issue as, and is unable to join us, so we hope Hope that you recover soon, Gilnara. Uh, Gilnara is an international independent expert on human rights, slavery, and human trafficking. Uh, she's been elected to chair various expert groups at the UN General Assembly. In 2004, she was elected by the Council of Europe as the first vice president of, president of the Intergovernmental Commission to prepare the Council of Europe Convention on Action. From 2008 to 2015, she served on the UN Human Rights Council as the UN Special Rapporteur on Contemporary Forms of Slavery at the OHCHR. Uh, she's worked in more than 40 countries assessing situations and presenting recommendations to governments. Uh, she's a member of the board of several international organizations and has numerous publications. She's received uh, several awards from uh, both uh, various governments and international organizations recognizing her work on anti-slavery and peace. She was the recipient of the Anita Augsburg Award in Germany. 
in Armenia. She's the founder and chair of the Democracy Today NGO, which does work in the areas of gender equality and peace building. Since the conflict over Nagorno-Karabakh, she's initiated many cross-border meetings and joint projects of Armenian women and youth with their Azerbaijani counterparts. In 2011, together with her team, she established the first International Young Women's Peace Award to continue the work of the famous writer and peace activist Anahit Bayandur. Through the years, young women from many parts of the world have become laureates of that award. Her presentation was to be titled Displacement of Women from Artsakh and International Legal Protection. Um, and uh, again, we hope that um, Gulnara um, really uh, recovers very, very soon. Uh, and now we come uh, to our fourth and last panelist of the day, uh, Mariam Avakian. Uh, Mariam is a PhD candidate at the Department of Electrical Engineering and Data Science Institute at Columbia University. Mariam served as the director of Quidix Armenia, supervising educational initiatives and large scale humanitarian aid distribution to displaced people and refugees, focusing on pregnant people of Artsakh. As a staff writer at Azad Archives, Mariam focuses on data based articles concerning women, such as bright kidnapping relationship abuse and others. Mariam has served as an adjunct professor of mathematics at the American University of Armenia and received her BS in mathematics and BS in electrical engineering at Trinity College, Connecticut, as well as an MS in electrical engineering at Columbia University. Mariam's presentation is titled, The Patriotic Woman from a Frontline Fighter to a Mother of Four. The screen is yours, uh, Mariam. Thank you so much, Hudik, for the introduction. And thank you, everybody, for inviting me. Um, I would like to start by saying that everybody on the conference has been a personal hero of mine since I was a kid. <laughs> so it's an absolute honor for me to be here. Um, and the second point before I start um, is a little disclaimer. As Hudik mentioned, my background is in engineering and mathematics. So I do not have the excellent and extensive training in social sciences as most of the presenters do, but I will uh, do my best to present my experience that is mostly practical and on ground work. Um, that being said, um, I will set my timer because I'm the last presenter and let's not go over time um, and I will share my screen. Um, okay, so as mentioned, um, my presentation is the patriotic woman. Oops, sorry, I'm not sure what's happening here. Right, uh, the patriotic woman from a frontline fighter to a mother of four. Um, as we saw um, uh, during the war, many things happened about patriotism, about men and women, and, and there's a lot to discuss. So in these 15 minutes, I'll try to do my best to discuss the, the idea of a hero in a, patriotic, um, in a patriarchal community during and after a war. So a table of contents of the talk will be, we'll discuss what it means to be a heroic man. Then we'll discuss what it possibly means to be a heroic woman in a patriarchal society. Uh, we'll go through some explicit messages that the media has shown us uh, that mm, we are not sure how a woman can be a hero, but there is one way for sure, and that's being a mother. And that, then we'll go through some statistics of um, my work at Quidix and uh, specifically in Project Mighty, where we worked with over 200 um, pregnant people. And finally, we'll close with the great misconception that if we have 12 Armenian beautiful babies, we will save our nation. All right, um, so the man, the patriot and the hero that we saw um, through media, uh, the news, social media, the meme pages and everywhere was the idea of the soldier. The soldier was somebody who embodied aggression and death, who was not scared of being killed, but it was also somebody who took on the role of the protector. So and we really saw this distinction between the soldier and the civilian, and the soldier was somebody who was masculine, and therefore the, the civilian, whoever was not fighting, was the feminine. This also meant that uh, men who did not fight, who were even slightly deviated from this idea of a soldier, were not men enough. Um, 
uh, therefore they were either scared to fight and they were called uh, feminizing terms. Um, and even those who had health issues and were not fit to fight were also apparently considered not man enough. However, when it comes to women, uh, during a war, can a woman be a hero? And, or maybe can a woman be a patriotic person, if not even a hero? Uh, so this is the question that we'll try to answer during this talk um, and uh, kind of reason about what happened, what we saw, what, what we saw and what really happened. There, there were two different things. So during the war in the media, we constantly saw very fragile and extremely feminine um, um, pictures of women. Um, women pictured in very passive positions, mostly waiting for their loved one to come back. Women pretty much sitting at home and wishing the best to the soldiers who were fighting. Um, while on the other end of the spectrum, men were pictured that they were fighting and they were writing their loved ones' names and bullets. Um, while women sitting at home were sending Snickers bars and saying, you should come home soon so we have a boy together. Uh, so this is what we kept seeing. On the other hand, what we have known for a while is that um, there are many women in our society who do many things. Um, Lara um, Abraman, uh, Aronian, for uh, example, um, when um, there was a lot of hate speech and even death threats towards her for, for speaking up for trans women for the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, one way that Pashinyan um, tried to um, protect her was saying, um, no, she is after all a mother of four. She comes from a good Armenian family and therefore she deserves to live. Please don't, don't threaten to kill her. So um, that was uh, one thing that we saw. And as a mother of four, she was a hero, but as a human rights defender, she wasn't. On the other hand, we saw Anna Hapopian, who um, again, as a mother of four, was um, pictured over and over in the media with her uh, military unit called Erato, that was supposedly uh, protecting the border. So we were getting mixed messages from the media all the time. Um, uh, there was a lot of confusion around this identity of the, the heroic woman or the patriotic woman. But one thing that we did see for sure was um, a woman could be a hero through motherhood. We saw um, the war procession ceremony <clears throat> excuse me, where there was a priest, a soldier, and a pregnant woman. Uh, the ceremony was summed up uh, with this scene. Um, and uh, this was supposed to um, symbolize faith, strength, and life. As we see um, this very linear thinking of, of basically putting women in a box and saying, okay, now men are back from the war. And now women's responsibility is to reproduce and give life and save the nation. So the survival of the nation is put on women's reproductive uh, ability. Um, the dictionary defines the word heroine as a woman admired for her achievements and the qualities. But in this case, we see that women were not admired for their achievements or qualities Rather, they were called heroines for giving birth, for being a mother. And uh, mind you, this was not to be a good mother. This was not for being, for raising children, for raising healthy and educated children and empowered children. This was for giving birth. Um, and here is an example from Artsakh Press where uh, Lucine um, is having her eighth child and the doctor is congratulating her and saying, you are a heroine mother. And this, um, the phrase heroine mother, Hero Suhimaid, comes up quite often in the media and in, in literature. Um, to which Lucine humbly answers, and the article is even praising Lucine for being so humble. Um, she says, by law, women who have 10 children are heroines. I only have eight. So we're even praising women who are not even giving themselves credit for giving birth eight times. Um, yet, um, so yeah, so women are um, heroes if they are mothers. 
Right, and here I have a little asterisk. So I don't know if you can see my mouse uh, moving, but there I added a little asterisk on, on the word woman because this is um, a straight and a married woman. So if we talk about women who are not straight and have 10 children, they will not be heroes. And if we talk about especially women who are not married and have um, 10 children, that's a whole different conversation. Somehow, uh, the right-wing conservatives uh, bring up this problem of the birth rate problem and um, magically linearly connect it to the survival of the nation by saying that, you know, if we have many kids now, we're going to be okay. And if we don't, then the nation will somehow die um, and Armenia will no longer exist. Completely um, dis disregarding the fact that uh, there are other factors that actually... Um, destroy the country, such as the economic struggles and migration and um, women's rights violations, etc. cetera. Um, the government in Armenia and Artsakh um, both have some structures to support birth rate uh, by providing quite low monthly stipends. Um, so all in all, we see a complete lack, lack of sustainable support. Um, this is when um, I was working at Quidics, and this is why we started Project Maidik. But the word Maidik in Armenian means mother. And what we did was when we were providing aid throughout Armenia and Artsakh, we kept seeing pregnant people in dire conditions. These were people who were um, displaced. And they had access to nothing. And um, if they were getting any kind of aid, they were getting aid that was okay for um, people in general, but it wasn't nearly enough for pregnant people. So we had people who um, didn't have access to hospitals, didn't have access to doctors, vitamins. Um, they were living in cold and damp conditions, and um, there were several cases of miscarriages given the stress and malnutrition and other health conditions that were not treated. Um, so even um, having a government or having a system that's encouraging birth rate, uh, we saw that there was absolutely zero structure to support pregnant people in, in a time of crisis. And when we, as we see, Armenia is a country that keeps facing crises, different types of crises, but they keep happening. So um, at the moment, I, in this presentation, I will, prevent, I will provide statistics for 263 Mairiks, um, majority of whom are currently located in Yerevan, Kotaik, Ararat, and Stepanakert. And by the way, most of them are um, the, um, located in Ararat region because the rent is cheap there. And even though um, living conditions are quite bad, but mm, that's the reality of the situation. Okay, so quick statistics about the project. Um, we had the age of um, mothers go from 17 to 51. And this is another point that I would like to mention. Um, the age of impregnation for um, our youngest mother was under question because we weren't sure if she was 15 or 16. And the law of consent um, in Armenia is 16. So people can give consent at the age of 16. And we felt during our work that this law was abused and um, many times um, the, the lines were blurred. Um, I would also like to point out that the number of children maximum was eight and the um, mean is 2.4. So uh, given our data set, and these were women who were displaced from Artsakh. We found them with different uh, methods, with different um, search uh, mechanisms. Um, so it's a fairly diverse um, and, and, uh, and a fair data set, I would say. So the mean is 2.4 children per woman. Um, quick, uh, another quick histograms, because I, I, I do like numbers. That is my training. So this is what we're seeing here. Um, so this is the number of mothers uh, at the age, uh, uh, at the moment of um, basically impregnation, given their age. So as you can see, the distribution is um, this resembling a normal distribution. The majority of people who were pregnant um, were in their 20s. And this is that, that data set that I mentioned, the, the troublesome one where um, the bride was um, either 15 or 16. Okay, moving forward to the next graph. Uh, this is number of children versus age. So each point here is one beneficiary. Let's take a look at this point, for example. The, so the mother is born in 1980 in this point, and they have one child. 
Versus if we look at the point at the very top, we have one mother who was born in 1985. And then if we go left, we see the number of children. So that's eight people. So a woman, um, next we have a woman born in 1991 and again, eight children. So this is kind of just, a, uh, just to see um, what's happening in the data set. And the majority of them, um, as you can see, have um, the median you can see somewhere at 2.4 and the ages are mostly in their 20s. Moving forward, based on what we saw during our home visits, our social worker evaluations, is that households with the most number of children were actually struggling the most. And it, of course, it makes sense, right? Um, but what I'd like to point out is that actually pretty much all households that had more than one, one child were struggling. Um, yes, this is a data set of displaced people, but what we see is that these families had no cushioning. They had no um, options either from the government or from their own, um, be it education, be it any kind of sustainability in their life, this was lacking. So when even a little bit of a shock happens, the entire structure falls apart and families are thrown into poverty very quickly. Additionally, what we saw is that the, 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 the larger the number of children, the more issues we saw for the children. For example, lack of speech, lack of um, mandatory vaccinations as infants and as children, malnutrition, etc. So while we um, as a system encouraged to have more children, in reality, th this is the reality and it's quite scary. So in fact, by encouraging to have more children, we're, I would argue that we're doing more harm than good. Uh, so to conclude the urgent needs, the recommendations that I would have, and my time is coming to an end, um, are obviously education and empowerment and a proper healthcare system. But one thing that I would like to point out is this third bullet point, that we must put a stop to this idea that the survival of the nation depends on reproduction. Because really in reality, women can do much more than that. Um, as we saw in reality, women were carrying major humanitarian work um, they kept the machine running, operating many systems that were left, um, serving in the military, providing medical support, et cetera, et cetera. And to um, answer a, in a very radical way of the question I asked at the very beginning, uh, can a woman be a hero in a patriarchal society? Uh, I would say absolutely yes. And a feminist woman or a feminist person is a patriotic person in a patriarchal society especially in a patriarchal society. And I would like to uh, thank all my heroes for, um, for doing everything that you do, um, especially in our society post-war patri and patriarchal society. Every feminist action is a heroic action. Thank you. And I would also like to thank um, Araxi and Dina for helping me with the talk. Um, thank you so much for your time. And that is it for today. Thank you so much, uh, Mariam, for also outlining the challenges that are um, ahead of us um, every single day. Uh, I would like to open the floor now uh, to questions, and um, you can uh, post your questions in the Q&A forum, or you can uh, add them in the chat, uh, so um, please do so, uh, so that we can have a uh, um, and engage the conversation and discussion. Uh, and uh, just a reminder as well, this is our very last panel uh, at the end of like this two day conference. Uh, so please post your questions. And uh, as we wait for, uh, uh, for those questions to come, I, I'm hoping. Uh, I just want like to go ahead with a very simple question I have like to each of you actually, uh, Mariam, Nona, and Karina. Uh, in the uh, face of the work that you do, the very difficult and heavy uh, and challenging work that you do day in and day out, um, as an activist and a scholar at the same time. Uh, so I just wanted to just know, I mean, how do you go through, I mean, how do you sustain 
yourselves uh, how do you in, in how do you go through when you are operating sometimes in such heavy um, and uh, in some cases uh, as Karina you talked about like toxic contexts as well um shall I try I can... okay Nona go yes ahead. go ahead Nona John Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Thank you very much for your question, Hudikta. And, and this is actually, um, you see, the, the problem is also that even in your, uh, let's say, homeland in, in Arabah, and I'm actually from Arabah, uh, you are accused in this Spain mania. I think everybody knows that. Uh, and um, this is not easy, and I wrote a methodological article on that. Um, yeah, but still, burning out is possible. But at the same time, uh, sometimes you understand that you immerse. Uh, otherwise, you can't see. Uh, you see, uh, you, you you just see that you you do step first step, and then you have one finding, and then. Uh, later on, continuing going there and asking people, questioning them, and you know, then you see that this is actually your, your findings get different dimensions, and this process is actually giving you power to, you know, just to survive, to 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 feel this curiosity and continue even though you think the the question is more or less your answer uh, yeah I, I mean this process is interesting thank you uh, thank you, Nona. And I know that you have been doing this for a long, long years, like uh, uh, more than a, uh, more than a decade, more than a decade or two, actually. So uh, it, it's incredible uh, that uh, the the sense of resilience as well is incredible, and that in itself is also an act of resistance as well. Uh, thank you so much, Nona. Okay. Karina, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Um. I kind of have ideas about how to answer this question, but I also feel like I, have, I haven't figured this out. So I don't know how to answer how I, I do keep going. I think one of the unhealthy ways I think that I kept going was the sense of guilt that I had it easier. So I need to do this, um, which is not necessarily, it's not a good thing, I don't think. Um, but for me, I think because this work is the most intensely meaningful work that I've ever taken on, um, that's been really good and easy for the days, you know, that are really hard to kind of get up and, and keep going, um, because it's still extremely taxing psychologically. Um, you end up subjecting yourself to a lot of hate speech and abuse. And I think the main source of support and, um, kind of motivation to keep going is connection and community, um, both community in this work. So, you know, doing this work together with others sharing the burden so that, you know, the, the burden of kind of figuring out next steps or coordinating, coordinating doesn't fall on, on just one person, um, as well as community outside this work. Ideally, you have a work-life balance. I don't. <laughs> um, but, you know, again, I'm saying that as someone who hasn't quite figured it out, I don't, I don't know. I'd be interested to hear what other people think. Thanks, Karina. Um, Maria. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question because um, going in, I had no idea, <laughs> but coming out, um, I actually drew a lot of power from Karina's post on Twitter. And every time I would open Twitter, I would just um, be amazed about how she's still going. And I was so in, um, inspired by her. So Karina, thank you. And um, one thing that did save me was my community uh, of, of Quidix, our, our team um, uh, otherwise, I don't know where I would be. <laughs> um, at times, because we were getting um, death threats, we were getting hate speech, and uh, you know, we're all on the same page uh, in the same boat about this topic. Um, it really helped just to um, just a reminder that we're not the crazy ones. There are other people who think the same way. We're not the only one um, uh, who are 
believing in these ideologies and who are fighting for it. So I would always, always recommend just be around, physically be around people who are going through what you are going through. Otherwise, um, I'm not sure what can happen. And this is why I really feel for um, people um, in the diaspora who are not close to Armenian communities, who are, say, living somewhere where there is not a big community. And it must have been an extremely challenging situation for them. And I applaud everyone who got through these hard times. Um, believe me, it's um, sometimes I tell people that I'm happy that I was in Armenia, um, even though it was extremely terrifying and traumatic. But I was happy that I was in Armenia during the war because it was kind of healing for me while uh, people who were away had to go through this double trauma and the guilt as Karina mentioned. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all for your honesty and but also your generosity as well in how like, you talk about this. Uh, we do have a few questions. So I'm going to start uh, with uh, Melissa's question. Uh, Melissa's question is to you, Mariam Jan, and she asks, she says, could you please tell a bit more about the relief work both material and emotional, uh, uh, sorry, just uh, queerings and other feminist LGBTQ organizations have done and been doing uh, during and after the war. Uh, thank you so much for that question. Um, it's an excellent question because there is an element of surprise in it. It's uh, the emotional aid work uh, part, which I'll get to in a second. Um, absolutely, the, uh, the, the physical aid that was given was by different organizations. Um, I felt we became a family. So sometimes, um, you know, Women's Support Center would call and say, hey, we have someone who needs what you have. And then we would call Women's Resource Center saying, hey, we have someone who has who needs heaters and you're giving out heaters. So everybody kind of came together. Um, and it was excellent to see this uh, naturally organized work being done. Um, I believe uh, a lot of the organizations we divided and conquered um, based on the need. And as we know, during the war, the needs were different on a daily basis. At Quidic, specifically at Project Mighty, we were um, giving out monthly boxes for the mother and the child. What we saw was that more often than not, the aid was for the child. So uh, the mothers were ignored. Um, many of them needed mammograms, vitamins, medication, blood tests, like people would normally do before and after giving birth. So that was the most important part of the aid that we gave out. Um, and the emotional, um, um, aid, I, if I can call that, was uh, very interesting, actually. Every time we had to go to Artsakh, um, we had to sometimes pretend to be a little bit dumb so they would let us through. Um, sometimes we had to pretend to be unaware. Uh, just the things we had to navigate through just to provide aid was ridiculous and incredible and funny in a way. Um, so that was actually some emotional weight that we had to carry as feminists. Um, do I even respect myself for doing that? I'm not sure. <laughs> but it is something we had to do for the greater good, which was delivering food to the bunkers. Another thing we did was um, during Project Mighty was working with these mothers. Actually, when there were um, attacks on Sunik, one of our mothers called us saying, can I just talk to you? I don't feel well. And somehow we, we became um, friends with our beneficiaries because in a war that's, it just happens. Many of them, um, one of them had an abusive husband. We actually went to Simado at Women's Support Center with this beneficiary. So the, not, the examples are numerous, but the emotional work that we had to put in and everybody had to put in this work, not just Quidis, everybody. Um, is something that I'm just realizing. So that's the element of surprise that for me, I also it just clicked that this actually happened. Uh, thank you so much, Mariam. And uh, we have a question from Tamar, Tamar Shivinian. And Tamar says, thank you all for all of the really great work and wonderful presentations. Following up on Mariam's critical statement, a feminist in a patriarchal society is a hero. I'm wondering if we can extend this to thinking about how someone who resists nationalism in a very nationalist context 
is also a hero? In what ways do we need to challenge nationalism, especially in the context of war and post-war anguish, anxiety? And I'm assuming, Tamar, that this is a question for all three or whoever would like to respond. Responses? Anyone, any of you would like to respond to Thomas? Questions? I would uh, like to quickly share that I absolutely agree that this parallel does exist of um, someone who resists nationalism in a very nationalistic context is also a hero and um, is under a great deal of threat um, in terms of everything. And in what ways we need to challenge nationalism, um, I'm having a hard time answering this because my immediate answer is in every way, but that's not specific. Um, one, one thing that does come to mind is, um, and which, which is something that I dearly care about, is challenging nationalism through the idea of um, the, the, the linear solutions that people are um, suggesting which is women have kids, men fight. Um, that's, that's this number one, the very urgent thing that I'm feeling that nationalism does need to be um, addressed, uh, which also really follows into we are the nation, we are such a great nation, we are higher than everybody else and other nationalistic ideas. Sorry, that was very, not, not very organized, but yeah. Uh, thank you, Mariam. Um, Karina, uh, you have a question from uh, Armen, Armen Marsubian, and Armen asks, what are the strategies for breaking the link between mainstream media and these Western uh, neoliberal experts, quote unquote, that is, who are constantly relied upon when anything about the Karabakh war is discussed? This comes out of a year long struggle I had with the New York Times. Well, first of all, commiserations for that. I know what that's like. Um, I think, I think this work has made apparent the need to continue questioning and critiquing the ideological structures and um, well, uh, of the prevailing kind of structural environment, which favors the perspective of these Western neoliberal thinkers, as you said. Um, and there's also a need to disseminate this thought to transcend the boundaries of universities and think tanks and kind of mainstream media organizations, because if these institutions remain the authoritative site for knowledge production around this context, we will need to continually examine the ways in which our voices and stories are undermined in them. And I think it's also worth kind of insisting really in an insolent way even um, that Armenians will write about Armenians in ways that illuminate and can be radically different from that of other scholars. So by actively refusing that kind of outside position of authority, we can encourage the assumption kind of out there in the world that Armenian writing about Armenians, you know, may have special insights. That's, that's what I'd say. Um, thank you, Karina. Um, and um, there is a question from Melissa to Nona. And um, uh, Nona Jan and Melissa asks, as Anna explained yesterday, the male dominated totalitarian family was a dysfunctioning family, even in the 19th century. And the Armenian intellectuals, both feminist women and pro-feminist men, took issue with this kind of family structure. Why do you think every time there is an attack on the survival of Armenians as a people, there is this going back to the same structure? Or is it not the same structure? Can we highlight women's roles and agency in making decisions and taking action to save the family, community during genocide, war, displacement, self-defense, etc., historically and today? How do you think we can rethink the family around the care work and define solidarity and care, not necessarily within the patriarchal unit as the core reason of Armenian people's survival and reframe the whole thing as such, instead of saying that 
we need to go back to the patriarchal family to survive. Can't mm -hmm. activists be considered an alternative family that saved lives, as Mariam said? Okay, thank you very much, Melissa, and thank you very much, Hurik. And this is a very interesting and multi-layered layered question, and um, and my my answer is kind of open, but would be um, would be that you know we have vect vectors of um, development and survival, and somehow circumstances uh, brings us to second way, to second vector, and you know even feminism in Karabakh. That was the finding of my dissertation back in two thousand five. That you know uh, how we can speak about feminism and liberation, liberalization of women, uh, liberation of women, uh, if the the first sentence of every report on on gender issues or women issues in Armenia is that women are economically very dependent. Uh, and you see, I think somehow this patriarchal structure is in a way um, functional. Uh, and even if it is dysfunctional, Women's are, women are so brainwashed some, sometimes that they, they, they can't accept it. They, they are afraid of going against mainstream. And after the war, the mainstream was actually, there was this marginal discourse on modernization and about women as, a, as an economic actors. Uh, but still, this uh, this mass, this, we don't have many examples. So that uh, so that to make these ideas to function as well. But still, uh, I also uh, had many interviews taken from um, conducted with men. Uh, and uh, I, I think that the issue of domestic violence after the war is not so, um, un, uh, I mean, uh, un unequivocal. I mean, uh, there are men who, who actually speak about partnerships, partnership with his wife, with their wives, saying, Karvija uh, Manak, during the war, she she was doing everything everything because i was on the front front line how i can beat her up so what i mean to say is also that you know we we can't we can't uh, mm, go out of the system when decision making is always man's prerogative and unfortunately uh, uh, my my recent research in in Garabar, in Karavajar in, back in 2016 uh, would show that uh, as soon as we have a very inattractive uh, field or domain of uh, exercising power like uh, completely destroyed villages then women are uh, kind of elected as a, as a uh, but as soon as they they make everything in order, they are kind of asked to to leave the position for men. So and this is why, uh, and this is exactly that process I was speaking about. That in the very beginning, I, I mean, until. 2010, even 15, I was a little bit proud that uh, gender relationships and, and women empowerment works differently in Karabakh compared to Armenia even. And, and then I just un understood that things are a little, a little, little bit hopeless. And I'm, I'm sorry, I have, I have no good news in this, in this domain. Thank you. Thank you, Nona. Um, 
Lena has a question uh, to um, Maria, and uh, she's actually asks if the government provided enough support to mothers, do you think it would be okay to connect survival with demography? Obviously, I'm asking this as someone who studied post-genocide anxieties about existence as it is connected to pronatalism. In connection to this, was abortion available to my weeks? Did they ask for it? Thank you so much for the question. And um, I was just typing an answer, so this is great. I can um, I can read it. Um, uh, dear learner, thank you so much for your question. And um, in my opinion, even if the government did provide enough proper support uh, to pregnant people, I would still argue that it's not okay to connect um, birth rates to the survival of the nation. Um, I would, unless the birth rate is absolute zero, in which case it's an extreme case. So let's not discuss that. Uh, but I would say that if we could come up with a list of several things in which birth rate um, would, would exist. So it would be birth rate, culture, history, many things that mean survival to us. Um, so kind of to redefine what it means to survive as a nation. Does it mean having people who are alive walk on earth, who have Armenian genes in a way? Does it mean people who sing Armenian songs or um, teach Armenian uh, alphabet, right? Um, I, I would say that it would be a collection of these things, then that would be, um, it would be fair to argue that um, that affects um, our survival, that our survival depends on that. But just um, the birth rate and, and um, reproduction um, alone, stand alone, I would argue that it wouldn't um, be fair to connect with survival and demography. I believe, um, oh. Yes, yeah, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, because there were a couple of other questions directed to you and I wanted like to connect to that as well, mm -hmm. Mariam, is that okay? Yes, yeah. so uh, there is a question from Victor Rajanian uh, to you uh, saying, while I fully agree that the fetish fetishization of women's family and reproductive roles is counterproductive and unacceptable, the reality of Armenia's very low fertility and its societal consequences should not be ignored. In your opinion, how could the discourses and policies be real realistically optimized? And Nona also had a, a question for you uh, where she's asking, is there a noticeable shift yet happening in younger generations embracing progressive change in face of traditional Armenian cultural uh, culture and identity roles? And if that shift is happening, how do we nourish it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you so much for these questions. And these questions nicely tied to Lerna's second question about abortion. Um, so uh, I'll start with Lerna's question and shift into Victoria's and then Anna's questions. Um, none of the Maidiks asked for abortion. Um, I believe when we met them, um, most of them were already past the point where they could get an abortion safely. But it is something that never came up, interestingly even though one of our beneficiaries did mention that she did not want to be pregnant and this was her husband's choice, slightly implying um, an incident of rape. Um, she still did not even, it seemed that she did not even consider abortion as an option. Um, one thing that I did want to mention in my presentation but I didn't have time for is this notion of uh, certain people moving to Armenia and opening um, fertility clinics. Uh, kind of um, something to help the birth rates. However, from what our research, we see that these people do not consider the choice of the option of offering safe uh, abortions. They only offer the option of helping the woman give birth and they call this support. However, when a woman walks into a clinic and is given with only, uh, presented with only one choice, this is already an issue especially if they're going to offer support, the support immediately becomes um, conditional. If they give support only if the woman decides to have the baby. Um, moving to Victoria's question, how could the discourses and policies be realistically optimized? Um, excellent question. I wish I knew, <laughs> but um, what I would suggest is uh, yes, low fertility is definitely a problem. 
combined with uh, migration, combined with domestic violence, combined with sexual violence. So the, as Maro mentioned, things have to work collectively for, for anything to work. There's this uh, great Russian cartoon where um, the, the lobster and the duck and uh, some other animal are pushing uh, a truck in different directions and they're not moving in any direction. I believe that's what's happening right now. The realistically optimized solution would be, I think we cracked the code, uh, working with mothers and children. So mothers who just gave birth. We noticed that um, we've done prenatal and postnatal classes at Quidix, and we noticed that sometimes even the husbands were coming, and that was such a big deal for us. So we kind of had our, we had an in to a newly formed family where the mother is, has just given birth and is freaking out in a way. She needs help, and she's recognizing that she needs help which is why they were very perceptive to not only the boxes we were giving, but also to the prenatal and postnatal classes. And in these classes where we're teaching progressive things, like don't be afraid of bleeding and it's not something that you should be ashamed of and it's okay to talk to your husband about that. Or if you see these symptoms, go to the doctor, it's okay. Uh, there's nothing to be afraid of. Um, so we saw that as soon as we work with the mothers who are new mothers, um, somehow their husbands are also interested. And I believe somebody in the panels mentioned that uh, new fathers are excited, They're, they want to be helpful and they want to care. So um, in my personal experience, I noticed that the people at this very part of their life when they just had a baby are very perceptive. So a realistic optimization of these policies would be working with these demographics. And uh, to move to Nona's question, I'm sorry for taking so much time, uh, to move to Nona's question, um, if the shift is happening, how do we nourish it? Um, I would say that a shift is definitely happening um, to, thanks to many things, um, and such as um, this conference, uh, to uh, people who have been doing this work for decades, um, how do we nourish the shift? Um, we just keep at it. Um, we have more conferences like this. We support each other. I, I learned during the war that just even putting heart emojis under somebody's picture meant a lot. So even small, small uh, ways of support uh, can go a long way because we don't know what the person is going through. And just com continuing to build our community. Um, Hudik invited me. I had the honor of speaking at one of her lectures. It was such an exciting opportunity. And after that, Hudik's students were just messaging me. It was amazing. Uh, so this little thing of support, that was such a big step that Hudik did towards nourishing this community that is still um, um, uh, still impactful. It still happens. The move, it, she did one thing, it's still rolling. It's still in motion. So that's my suggestion. Thank you for listening. Sorry for some long answers. Uh, the long answers are important, and this is our final panel, and it's very, very important. Uh, we have, um, um, uh, I'm just going to the comment from uh, uh, Melissa here, and then like there is another question from Anahi that I want to get to, and Melissa says, uh, the whole pro and against life artificial divide is to obscure the fact that those who force women to give birth by stigmatizing or criminalizing abortion are also the ones who don't really care about the quality of lives of Armenian and non-Armenian parents and their children, feminists that work in Armenia. I'm not even mentioning those who advocate for killing, uh, for killing queer individuals, feminists, environment, or labor activists, etc. And uh, I'm going to go to uh, Anahit Simonian's question, and I think that it is a, a wonderful uh, question to also uh, bring our uh, conversations to uh, a conclusion maybe uh, today, um, temporarily, I'm hoping, because hopefully like these are conversations that we're going to continue to have. And Anahit says, thanks very much to all the panelists and uh, the great presentations. My question is for all, for everyone, for Nona, Karina, and Mariam. Uh, and it is something I think a lot about how to create more feminist space for the post-war recovery of women as for all of us, how to collectively impact on the way the trauma that is, it is being dealt with in the society as well as addressed and, uh, addressed and by therapists and recovery programs, initiatives, etc.
who would like to start about how do we create more feminist space in the post-recovery uh, time? I have some, you know, kind of vague initial unformed thoughts or kind of feelings really more than thoughts. Um, it's, it's a broad question. It's something I actually grapple with a lot as well. Um, I think, I, I think Anna, if you actually kind of said it, like how do we build the community? How do we create feminist community? And I think, again, it's for me anyways, it's the importance of connection. Um, it's the importance of also kind of recognizing our broader goals and kind of reminding ourselves and each other about those goals kind of all the time. So that, you know, when, whenever kind of, micro level disputes or kind of dis, um, disagreements kind of come up that they don't, they kind of don't derail the larger mission and the larger vision and just to kind of keep your eye on the ball. And I think there's also something to be said about living your life as a feminist in a very uncompromising way so that, you know, these things are very, um, um, what's the word? Where you help me. Um, they spread. <laughs> I can't, my, my brain stopped working. It's, it's almost 11 here. But um, yeah, you know, it's inspiring when you see um, your colleagues, your friends, your peers kind of be uncompromising. And it kind of encourages you to think, oh, you know, I can, I can do this. I can kind of draw the line. I can say no. Um, I think this is a, you know, um, this is an important thing. I think you're just starting with yourself and your community. Um, yeah, that's what I would say. Uh, and Tamar got in there and said viral feminism and Tamar yesterday was just saying that as well that it, in her session about how it is important to make that stand and to make to ask those uncomfortable questions and to also actually make the stand and say that this is my stance this is where I am right so yeah. yes viral feminism it is viral and, and the word I was looking for was contagious yeah. <laughs> so thank you Tamar for kind of <laughs> <laughs> yes uh, viva sisterhood um Nona, Mariam. Oh. Um. Shall I try? Uh, yes, no, Najam, go ahead. Yes, yes. Yeah, thank you very much for this really challenging question. Yeah, if, if take the question seriously and fundamentally speaking, um, I, I always, uh, I always be, believed that textbook issues and kindergarten things um, are, are very important, uh, and this means we also right now we are having a political context that it looks more or less possible, uh, but still. Um, um, having spent a lot of time in Rarabar and here, I just see so much um, resistance from below. And, and that makes me feel uh, not optimistic. This is why I, I am thinking about long perspectives, uh, which means uh, changing the curriculas in the universities, in schools, and in textbooks, because the, uh, the uh, research of the textbook content, contents in the, for elementary school in Armenia shows that even mathematical tasks, the Dutch uh, tasks are uh, somehow uh, written in a way that you always see this um, labor division, genderly unequal, and uh, these passive active roles and many, many things like that, which on a subconscious you know, level always conveys this message of hierarchies and who, whose place is where. So, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Nonaton. Mariam? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll keep my answer short. Um, so, um, as Tamar said, uh, our answer should be yes. So what if we're all gay? <laughs> What's the problem with that? Um, and that was my inspiration for 
uh, writing emails the way I do with a lot of exclamation marks um, instead of you know saying no you should write like I mean write in a quiet voice and uh, be serious it never really worked so recently I'm writing emails the way I would like to um, so that's my advice we keep at it and we uh, refuse to yield in any way Thank you. Uh, thank you all of you for, uh, for the panelists, for these uh, incredible presentations, not just today, but these two days as well. Thank you for all these uh, thoughtful, thoughtful questions uh, that uh, take us uh, to uh, so many uh, 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 so many different uh, uh, routes and uh, discussions and uh, much, much, much fo uh, food for thought and action together. And uh, I do hope that these conversations uh, uh, do not are not just uh, uh, in the form of isolated events of like an annual or a biannual conference on gender issues, but that they become like the actual staple of our everyday work uh, in this post-war uh, recovery period uh, and ahead in the months and the years to come. And because we certainly need this type of praxis uh, in the work that, um, uh, that we're doing. And we need this praxis to inform uh, both our decisions and our work together. So a heartfelt thank you uh, to all of you for your generosity, for your deep, deep, deep reflections and for sharing uh, all of this uh, in such an eloquent way, in such a profound way, and in really like uh, connecting us all uh, across like all these, uh, all these continents together. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Harik. Um, I will just uh, close by saying uh, thank you. That was a wonderful conclusion. Um, so this is the end of gender and intersectionality in post-Soviet Armenia. A big thank you to our panel chairs, our speakers. Uh, it was a fantastic conference. I learned a lot. We wanted this conference to kind of bridge the academic scholarship and the work being done on the ground um, in a multidisciplinary analysis of past and present gender related issues in Armenia. And ultimately we wanted this conference to have a meaningful impact on Armenian society today. And I truly believe that the discussions we've all had um, led to progressive observations, critical recommendations for decision makers, um, for the Republic of Armenia, but even universally. I think I learned a lot that I could apply here in Canada as well. Um, so the Zorian Institute, I will let you know, intends on publishing a report based on some of the findings and recommendations that were brought up in, in the, these past two days. So for all of the panelists here and listening as attendees, um, we would love all of your suggestions and recommendations. I'll be in touch um, and we, we should stay in contact um, in the coming months to get this um, underway. And I would like to give special thank yous again to Professor Melissa Bilal, her immense support and guidance on this conference from conceptualization to the execution. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, you've done so much work for us and really appreciate it. Um, Victor Agajanian, again, thank you for your support. And of course our partners, uh, the UCLA Promise Armenian Institute, uh, notably Professor Anne Karagosian and Hazmik Bagdasarian, thank you. Um, and our supporting departments and institutions to help, who helped us spread the word about this conference. So the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research, the Arat Eskegia Museum, the UCLA Gender Studies Department, and the UCLA Center for Near Eastern Studies. Thank you for helping us spread the word. So more information on the Zorian Institute can be found on our websites for upcoming programs and publications and events. Um, so zorianinstitute.org. I think my colleague Allison has been sharing links today. So feel free to check out the chat and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you again so much. And we hope to see you again at another event. Take care.